Did you ever think you would make it? I feel I'm so close, I could take sweet victory. I know this life meant for me. Yeah, why would you bet on Goliath when we got bet David? Value came in, giving values contagious. This world of entrepreneurs, we get no value to haters. How they run, homie, look what I become. I'm the, I'm the one. All right, so another special podcast today with mm -hmm. a uh, with the great uh, Charlie Kirk, aka uh, Andres called him Mr. Kirk, aka Vinny called him Captain Kirk. Captain, How are you doing? That's I'm, I'm doing great. Good morning and congratulations on uh, the New York Yankees news. That's amazing, Patrick. Well, thank you. Great. Yes, thank you. I'm excited about your event coming up. You thank you. Some thirty thousand people here. Not thirty, but What's, we'll have, we'll have six thousand and. Uh, so million. Kaylin is telling me thirty thousand. So what, is is it, is it thirty thousand or six thousand? <laughs> no, it's six thousand. Okay. We'll have millions online, but not. There was fifty thousand people there. Uh, it's it was the biggest huge. event ever. It was huge. I'm, I'm a stickler for precision, so we'll have about six thousand. Where are you there. doing the event at? Uh, Palm Beach Convention Center. Palm Beach, and, and what's the capacity uh, there? How big uh, can it get? The, that that that's the capacity. Is a, uh, it's a jostle with the fire marshal right now. Got it. So, so if you say thirty thou, and it is, I love it when some of my competitors would say, "We had thirty thousand people at the MGM Grand Arena on the website. Maximum capacity fourteen thousand well, five hundred. Yeah, you know, I would say. Yeah, and I mean, if you get thirty thousand people to something, yeah, that's an amazing accomplishment. I mean, we do events professionally. Sure. We do events sure. every couple of weeks. And so our biggest event's like twelve thousand people, and that's yeah. that's a big undertaking to even get to twelve thousand. I mean, that's oh, that's no huge. question about it. It's a multi-million-dollar budget, yeah, AV huge. schedule, calendar yes, yes. seating. You know, Promotion, how are you going to keep speakers, people happy? Security, insurance, all, all of it. Why did you give me this much time? I want to talk on the last day. Who's the closing speaker? Yep, you got a bunch of things going. It's a lot of work, but you're doing it, and you're doing a great Thank job, you. and you've taken it from. Uh, uh, you and I, first time you and I met, I think it was six years ago, seven, I don't even know what it was, eight yeah, years ago maybe? That's right, and uh, it was at our Young Women's Leadership Summit in right. Dallas. It was in Dallas, yes. Yeah, it was but you were a man ago. at the time. I, I, still, still I, I still am yes, a man. So not sure. much has changed. Not much has changed in well, that area. Well, a lot has changed good. in the last six, that, eight that, years that, regarding that's that topic. Right. Well, yeah, actually, at that event back then, <clears> the trans <throat> thing we weren't talking about at all. That's right. The Me Too thing was kind of the <clears> yeah. the main kind of cultural pathogen that we were debating. And now... The idea of being a woman is is now, uh, I guess, an open question in society. Being questioned, people are changing their minds. And there's a couple stories. We're going to get into these stories. Uh, uh, first one, Adam uh, really wanted to get into this story by The Hill. Adam's uh, <clears throat> Biden's life expectancy and its mm. implications. Mm. Uh, we have uh, uh, another one from Town Hall saying Biden has spent nearly 40% of his presidency on vacation. Biden skips NATO leaders' dinners uh, as staff cities. A recent workload saying he was working too hard, even though he just came off of a vacation marjorie taylor green demands joe biden be tested for cocaine it's an interesting thing to do <laughs> Zelensky slams biden's unprecedented and absurd stance on nato membership chris christie is everywhere uh he says he has doubts uh, over hunter biden's investigation either a lie or incompetent gop presidential candidate chris christie calls trump's social media behavior reckless and uh, he says he does not believe the audience was a size that they claim it was Ron DeSantis <laughs> says he would be Trump's run he wouldn't be Trump's running mate. I'm not a number two guy. DeSantis donors privately worry about campaign as Florida governor uh, lags in 2024 polls. Interesting story by CNN. RFK says he would prosecute Fauci as president if crimes were committed. He caused a lot of injury. Wagner boss Yevgeny Prigozhin likely dead. Putin meeting probably <laughs> faked. Retired general says this is actually a New York Post story. Women are posting about their lazy girl jobs on TikTok. How fascinating. ESPN layoffs. And uh, you're seeing what's going on there with the list of names they had. BBC suspends star presenter over alleged sexual explicit teen photo scandal. But they said he's going through mental yeah. and, and anxiety issues right now. So you have to yeah. go to the hospital. And then uh, BlackRock, Larry Fink, is uncomfortable using the word ESG. Then we got Disney World has a bigger problem than Ron DeSantis. People aren't going. Mm -hmm. And as CNN apologizes for misgendering uh, uh, Dylan Mulvaney, this next one I think you're going to appreciate a lot. It's a spiritual one. Male sex offenders faking trans identities to move to women's prisons. Very interesting uh, dynamic. Mm -hmm. And then Zuck shows a six-pack. But I think the first question, Adam, you okay? Yes, sir. Yes, okay. sir. Shifting, shifting. I think the first question I want to get into is the following. Here's the first question I want to ask you, okay? Very softball type of a question to start off the entire thing. Like, Pat, Pat, before you start, can I make yeah. a, a confession? And I, I, I just I have to do it. What's uh, I don't know if it's going to affect Charlie wanting to even sit next to me, but I did go to the gym 
this morning, and according to MSNBC, I'm a right wing. No, you're right. Wing. <laughs> Hitler, okay, now, do you want me to still sit next to you? I, I mean, I can leave. You're a right wing extremist. Should I? Are you cool yeah, with that? How that dare I, you? Because you went to the gym too. So oh you're what are you, God. Hitler? That's Is that right. cool? Are you all right? No, you're Timothy McVeigh if you yeah. bench, if you okay. bench press. All right, so I just I just I had to get that out there because he might not want it. Yeah. By the way, can, can you, you've lost some weight since we've seen you. Your head has shrunk. Your body's well, like. Well, look, I have a disproportionate head to the rest of my body, so I. I remember you saying through. that the yes. last time. No, it's 100 percent correct. Okay, you look great. Self-deprecation. So, what's your been your regimen as a right wing extremist who likes to work out, bro? I intermittent fasting helps a lot. Hell yeah. And then actually cutting out all dairy was was for me. It doesn't work for everybody. For me, it was huge and i already did low carb as it was so i try to keep carbohydrates below 50 grams a day okay. and then uh you know working out four or five times you're doing it so no so. dairy you drinking soy no don't be a soy, soy boy, boy. I mean, that's but, ridiculous but you, you really don't need dairy in your diet at all i mean so if you need a thinner in your coffee almond milk or coconut milk mm -hmm. you know kind of what what about babies they need some some dairy uh you'd be surprised yeah yes and no i mean um there's it's called ca cassian i think is what it's called which mm -hmm. is the precursor of what you could call dairy some babies actually have a sensitivity to it but um yeah i think we over overplay our dairy card in the west and actually the dairy that we consume is not is I think far far more toxic and um, not actually as helpful as the, the if you have like raw milk or if you go to a real dairy farm then it's different but mass produced dairy I actually think is um, you've done your research on this Hell, yeah. situation I, 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 you're here. offending Adam because uh, yeah. his first nickname was soy boy so Adam, yeah, Adam was a soy boy but now I'm a let, soy man let me let me get into my yeah my question. I apologize let me, yes, sir let I just had to let him know let yes, me sir. get into <laughs> my question let me get into my question so. <laughs> Uh, your event's coming up. It is. In the state of Florida. Great state of Florida. Yeah. The speakers you have lined up right now are Donald Trump, Tucker Carlson, Charlie Kirk, yourself, Dan Bongino, Bannon, Jr., Hawley, J.D. Vance, Schmidt, Asa Hutchinson, Gates, Roger Stone, uh, Bo Bear, you got uh, Posobiec, uh, Benny Johnson, Vivek Ramaswani, Bernie Moreno, Senator Ted Cruz, Mayor Suarez. I can go on and on and on and on with the names that you have going on. There's another event going on in Iowa, mm -hmm. and it's hosted by a company called The Blaze. I don't know if you recognize them or not. They have a guy named Tucker Carlson going there as yep. well, and another guy named Vivek, Tim Scott, Nikki Haley. They have Mike Pence, also Asa, and a few other people. Uh, but they have Ron DeSantis going to his event. But why didn't you invite the governor oh, to did. your event oh. in Florida? No, no, we invited everyone. Okay. Yeah, just for the record. And uh, every single candidate got an invite. In fact, we actively were trying to get the governor to come. And what was the reason for him? Because it's... He declined. Why would he decline to a Florida event? No, it's perplexing, Patrick. I mean, I'm a big fan of the governor's. Yeah. I consider him a friend. I think he's running a terrible presidential campaign. And we're going to have 6,000 people there. But... It's not just 6,000 people. We're, we're going to have 500 donors. We are going to have 300 pastors. We're having 250 social media influencers that generate millions of eyeballs. We have over 2,000 of what we consider super activists. These are people that are full-time in politics. Local precinct committee members, state party chairmen. These are people that donate, show up to events. And so it's confusing why Governor DeSantis in his home state would not attend He's going to be in the state, according to his public schedule, in Tallahassee. He could easily come down on Sunday, a day that Trump is not speaking. Um, I think it's a huge missed opportunity. I Hopefully he fixes his error. We did it. Per I personally invited Nikki Haley, Mike Pence, Tim Scott. You know, Obviously, I'm a pro-Trump guy. As an organization, though, we wanted to create a venue and a format to talk to the grassroots. As you could tell, we have Governor Asa Hutchinson, who is like the polar opposite of where I no am question. philosophically. Yeah. But we try, we're trying to be honest brokers. Okay, you have 6,000 people. You want to be the president of the United States? Come make your case. I will insist the audience is respectful and that they allow you to have a fair hearing. Um, but I'm disappointed. Governor DeSantis, I don't, I don't want to read too much into it. I don't want to speculate. But I could tell you the response from the grassroots, the people that are attending our event, they're confused, they're upset, and they say, oh, this is just more of the same. Governor DeSantis is making time for a lot of fundraisers, and it's disappointing he will not come. This is the largest grassroots event of the summer. Nothing comes even close. As far as numbers, capacity, influence. Patrick, we have 155 credentialed media coming. I mean, you turn over a rock, there's a New York Times reporter, you know, that's going to be coming to our event. Not just that, CBS, ABC, NBC. And what is the current narrative? The current narrative is actually true that DeSantis is failing to challenge Trump. That's 100% true. You can see it in the grassroots, you can see it in the audience, you can see it in polling. And so why wouldn't you then go into the arena and address the audience that has doubts about you. It, it, it's, um, 
Some people are calling it insulting. It's hard to disagree with that. I don't consider it a personal insult. It's politics. You make your own calculation. I've known the governor for six years now, um, but this is this is a mistake. For what it's worth, uh, last time you were here, we did a podcast a couple months ago. I don't know when it was, four months ago, three months ago. And I asked you a question about both candidates, Trump and DeSantis. You were very respectful of both. You said you're friends of both. You, you were very diplomatic. You were not taking a side or the other. You were saying he should run. You yes. said this is something he ought to do. You have to get in the ring. Maybe it's going to be tough, maybe, but this is how we learn. So you were very much of someone who defended him yes. when, when I was challenging. But, but, but here's a question for you. So for me, when I'm, when I'm talking to all the different camps, I have a very easy time getting a text back, a call back, a message back from every camp except for one camp, and that's the DeSantis camp. How much of this, because yeah. this is your world. So for me, all I know is how to be a CEO. And as a CEO of a company, if one of my guys you reach out to, he's probably asking me, so the pace he gets back to you, it's really my pace, right? Mm -hmm. The speed of the leader that's determines right. the speed of the path, 100%. right? So how much of this is he's just got a bad marketing team, and how much of it is him just being slow to get back because he thinks his strategy is... I'm above it all. I don't need to be there. I don't need to experience this. I'm going to do whatever I want to do, and I'm still going to win. Yeah, and, and that's a mistake to think that way. So let me just yeah. kind of tell you. One phone call to President Trump, he's like, I'm all in. I'm there. Let me know. Right. He is earning the front runner status, status right now. There is zero entitlement on behalf of Donald Trump. I had dinner with him a week and a half ago. We have a very good relationship. I think the world of him, he's a great president. Don't agree with him on all the stuff he did, especially with Fauci and the vaccine. Whatever. He was a great president. I'm 100% behind him. And I am really thrilled with how he's trying to earn the nomination, doing events, doing rallies, doing interviews. Vivek Ramaswamy, to his great credit, text message in five minutes. Charlie, I'll be there. It is very difficult to get communication from Governor DeSantis's team. I completely agree. I don't know if that's the pace of the executive, the CEO. I don't know if it's a culture around there, but... I'm telling you right now, he, he's on pace to finish third or fourth in this primary. Vivek Ramaswamy is on pace to be the second vote getter in this nomination. That's wild. So, he, uh, that, that's so, so, so Charles, you would say like right now, he just, there's no, there's no, like even if right now DeSantis wakes up and goes, guys, whoever is in charge, out. No, New team, man, he's done. It's somewhat fixable. I'm not saying it's done. I'm not saying yeah. that, but he's trending. The trajectory is really poor for him. It's He's coming across as if he feels like he's entitled. He's, he's engaging in a policy debate where the Republican base does not want a policy debate right now. They want who is going to go in with a spine and honestly the balls to go into D.C. and fight against this uniparty regime. It's it's a lot more ethos and pathos than it is logos. So he's entering this like it's a Yale policy debate. Like, oh, high taxes, low taxes. He's using like really weird, abstract academic terms that I can resonate with, which is we're going to securitize the border. Like, yeah, nobody talks like that, okay? <laughs> mm -hmm. How about yeah. Donald Trump says, I'm going to build the wall and I'm going <laughs> to deport the enemies. Like, that resonates. But more than that, Donald Trump is an alpha beast, and people want that in this hyper-feminine postmodern culture we're living in. And so they look at him, and yeah, he's willing to go to CNN with Caitlin Collins and just take questions and like, you're a liar and you're a fraud and you're a fake. And so Trump's going to come to our event. And he's going to be wearing a you know, big red tie and talk for an hour and a half. And you look at him and you have an attachment to him because, like, that guy's going to be able to go toe to toe with Xi Jinping, mm -hmm. right? He's going to be able to, who, whatever world leader you want, okay? And so then there's, there's this attachment where he almost creates this, like, mythological type of um, archetype where young, young people, all people see it and they say, there, that guy has the status, the attitude, the vibe, and the energy. Governor DeSantis is like, yeah, I did great in Florida. Now elect me as president. And people are like, no. I actually, I want someone who can go into the UFC ring and dethrone the alpha. And until you can go into the, the arena and out-Trump Trump, you're going to finish second, third, fourth, or fifth. This is not a policy debate. You, you know, it, it's it's interesting you're saying that. But by the way, just a quick question. Are you also inviting RFK or RFK? No, we did. Known? We oh, did. So he's not available. Yeah, and he texts me back. He says, Charlie, I'm trying to win a Democrat primary. <laughs> <laughs> That's yeah. hilarious. And I said, dude, I'm a big fan of yours. By the way, I think he's awesome. And I disagree with him, obviously, on so many. I always have to disclaim this because people say, oh, he's the worst on these 10 things. Yeah, okay, great. The stuff he talks about with Fauci, 
the toxins in our food and our air and water and how the pharmaceutical companies are poisoning us mm -hmm. love it. I think that's a mistake on his on his end to not come. I to totally either. agree. Let me tell you why. I'll give you my because you said you're obviously biased on why. You, let me say why I would say it because I actually think. You know, if he goes to that event, he's going to get a different response than he thinks he's going to get. I think they're going to go crazy for they him. They would go wild. Wild Patrick. for him because he is a, you know, the community that can't stand censorship. They're going to love him. The community that couldn't stand the vaccine. Even some of the people that were like, hey, Trump may be the vaccine. RFK is not the vaccine guy. They're going to be for RFK. And uh, who knows if if even if, if it comes down to pushing the idea of getting a debate, if Biden drops out, you're going to want the other side to want you to win as a Democrat to see. I don't know. I think it's a mistake. I think he should. If there's one event he needs to be at, I think he needs to be at your event. It's funny. He said no. To I, I, I pestered him about it. You know, we were texting yeah. and, you know, he was sweet about it. He wasn't a jerk. Right. right. But he's like, I'm trying to win a Democrat he's primary. Very sweet, yeah. And, and all that. And he's come on my program before on our yeah. podcast. You know, people can look it up. It was a really robust and great conversation trying to get him back on. I really like RFK Jr. because he's willing to call out the security state and the administrative state, this fourth mm -hmm. branch of government, which I believe is the existential threat to our freedom and liberty and the promise of self-government that our founders laid out in the Constitution. He gets it. He even makes claims that his uncle and his father were killed yeah. by yeah. the... Well, CIA. his uncle and his father, he alludes to, but Shh. his uncle in particular. I totally sympathize with that sentiment. Um, yeah, sorry. No, uh, from a logistical standpoint, you, you, I don't want... You mentioned this kind of just... In passing, you're like, yeah, I'm texting JFK. So yeah, I'm texting well, Trump. I, I, I'm like, not texting JFK. I'm sorry, that RFK. Be... <laughs> All right, that'd be that'd be that, pretty impressive. Don't, don't get the from, from some, some people think he's still alive. Yeah, so. yeah, exactly. <laughs> the flat Earth community. Yeah. Um, here's my question: You're actually texting RFK. Yeah. Are you actually texting Trump? No, I call. Okay, him. you but you call him. Mm -hmm. Picks up the phone. Yeah. Like second um, or third ring. How many other candidates are you uh, calling and or I mean, texting Vivek, directly? Vivek, Nikki Haley, I text okay. with. I'm on. I, I've liked Nikki for years, even though she's totally wrong on Ukraine, uh, and has really become more neoliberal and stuff. Uh, probably most of the field. So yeah. to be clear, you're calling Trump. He's picking up. Boom. Yeah. Second or third. What about DeSantis? No, I, I can't reach him. So hold on. Let me get this straight. You can call Donald Trump. He picks up the phone, speaks with you. And you can't even yeah. reach well, Governor I'll, DeSantis? I think Patrick would agree with what I'm saying here because it's consistent with a reputation he has. But I will say this. Trump has uh, – uh, people have all negative stuff about Trump. Here's what I love about him is he is so reachable, so accessible, so communicative. The guy works his tail off. Like even wow. when he was pre – That he is was, shocking He was president. Hear. Like once I needed to reach him on something and he was in Tokyo or something negotiating and he takes the call. And he's like, Charlie, I'm really busy. What's up? And it's like, that's who he is. It's <laughs> I get to him putting you on speaker. Charlie, I'm out here in no, Tokyo. But, but, but he cares about people. He cares about his relationships. Yeah. He He's always been there for me. And again, some some people have stopped giving money to Turning Point because they say, oh, you're too close to Trump and all this. I say, okay, whatever, we're going to be fine. But honestly, I have a deep sense of loyalty and appreciation for a man who took a 24, 25 year old seriously enough, yeah. then I'll just take my call, bring him to the Oval Office, and I, he is more communicative with me than not just DeSantis, but most senators that I deal with. Look, look uh, so, so I have worked with a lot of sales leaders, and I know this is gonna be a random uh, analogy, but you'll see where this goes. So we have 45,000 insurance agents, 15,000 active agents. And I'll, all the complaints will come to me from their sales leaders they work with. And I'll see sales leaders, they develop other leaders that become very successful. This guy becomes a... Guys, what's going on here? No, he's sweating. No, I was hot. What do no, you want to do? No, I'm, I'm fine. Okay, so just text them, tell them yeah. you got AC. We'll turn yeah. on the AC. You guys keep talking. We're doing a podcast. So this sales leader comes in, and they'll say, uh, uh, they'll say, you know, I can never get a hold of XYZ. Never. I can never get a hold of them. Pat, I got an easier time getting a hold of you as a CEO than I got to uh, get a hold of XYZ. And then you look at the results... They don't duplicate anybody. They don't develop any leaders. And I want to ask them, why don't you, why don't you pick up the phone? Why wow, that guy hasn't earned the right to earn my time yet. I said, buddy, it's the other way around. Like, you got to earn everyone's vote. You got to earn their vote for them to say, I want to work with you. I think politics is the same way where you have to go earn the vote of the person. In capitalism, we vote with what? With I'm going to choose to spend to buy this coffee from Starbucks over I'm going to buy this coffee from 
Coffee Bean. No problem. That's a form of voting, right? You vote with but, your pocket. But Schultz has got to go earn that. And Schultz, if the Santa's you mean? No, no. Schultz is Starbucks. Oh, gotcha. Schultz, Schultz has got to go gotcha, earn that. Gotcha, gotcha. So Schultz will go and sit there at a hearing, and they're bashing him, trashing him, and then he says, look, I think you just got a problem with me being a billionaire. Yeah, yeah. I started off with nothing. I'm not going to be apologizing for being a billionaire. And you know what you say? Politically, you don't agree with Schultz. But you know what you do agree? You agree with brass balls yeah. to sit there agree. and defend yourself. And that's a tough I, business, and by the way. That's a, a very, very tough it's business. It's a labor-intensive, low-margin, high-volume business. And, 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 and you're awesome. dealing with $15, 20 an hour employees. And that, tons that, of competitors, <laughs> by the way. And yeah. it's, he, he basically turned a billion-dollar brand from what used to be considered to be just a commodity. I got to get coffee. What do you need? Yeah. He created a whole experience. I, I have a ton of respect for what Schultz has built. That's very, very – and for you to have grown your business to where it's at, you know how hard it is to yes. kind of get it. So. For me, the biggest challenge with DeSantis, if you go on their policy, and if we were to take all the candidates and on 20 different policies, let's just say, okay, and you would say, which one of them do you agree with most on policies? DeSantis is probably going to be up there. Of course. But there's one big factor there. you got to have the audacity to go out there and sit with people. Mm -hmm. If you don't, how can the people that you want to vote for you feel confident knowing you're going to go sit with the enemy and people who are really scary who can't stand you? And the more and more you take this approach, the more you come across as a, hate to say this, you come across as establishment. You come across as I'm too good. You're not on my level. You, I know you, what you, I know what's good for you. And you nailed it. You said he like the, the entitled. Like he did such a great job with COVID. He's that employee pet that thinks his resume is so awesome. He doesn't mm. have to interview. Yeah. He's just like here, take that. My yeah, I, I totally agree. My favorite word in the English language is earn. I think our entire economic system needs to be based on earning. Love that. And I think our politics needs to be based on earning. And to Donald Trump's credit, he wants to earn this nomination. He's acting as if it's an open field. He's running to win. Ron DeSantis is not exhibiting the behavior, the language, or even the flexibility. You know this in business, right, Patrick? If you're not doing well, then fix something. Change a message. Change your approach. Don't keep on doing what doesn't work. I mean, it, it's... That is the it, definition of insane. That is the, de the definition of insane, and it, it doesn't make any sense. And so... Here's what also what I'll kind of say about Trump, which is people have grew an attachment with him throughout his him literally being president. So how does one beat Trump in a primary? Not that I'm like one to give advice. Well, I don't know. You have to talk to the new Republican Party that, guess what, doesn't want us to be involved in Ukraine, doesn't want open borders, doesn't want limitless trade deals. And, Patrick, you, you hit it perfectly. If you understand the Republican base, which— I believe that I understand it better than most. Our podcast is the most, by proportion, conservative Republican podcast out there. Democrats really don't listen to our show, and that I wish they would, but it's this. They are a scorned community. How many times, from Mitt Romney to Paul Ryan to Mitch McConnell, have they heard the same tired talking points to see them go to D.C. and let them down? So they're hyper-paranoid that somebody is going to swoop in and be purchased by the war lobby, the pharmaceutical lobby, and that's Trump's appeal. Trump's appeal. The more he's indicted, the more he's attacked, they say at least he's not Paul Ryan. Yeah. Uh, and and the more and more we talk about this, unfortunately, it's not changing. It's not like they – It's you know how sometimes you – Stephen A. Smith will say something, and let's just say the Lakers will make an adjustment. You're like, I don't know if it was because of Stephen A. Smith, but they made an adjustment. Or like a coach who's a commentator will say something, or Shaq will say, I'm going to make this adjustment if I was a center. And you're like, okay, they kind of listened to what Shaq said or Kenny Smith said. Everybody is saying this. That camp has to listen. But there's something I want to talk about real quick here before we get into the next topics. Earlier this week, the Bank for International Settlement released its 2022 survey on central bank digital currency, CBDC, the results showed 93% of central banks are working on a CBDC. Let me say this again. 93% of central banks, 18% of them, said they're likely to use a CBDC in the near future. The jurisdiction of these banks represents 82% of the world's population and 94% of uh, global economic output. Before we get into the story, it, it, the, the one thing that everybody has to know where I stand this is why I own a lot of gold. And not only physical gold, I have it in you know funds, but I own a lot of gold. So American Hartford Gold will ship. This is why we chose to uh, uh, team up with our new sponsor, American Hartford Gold. We uh, went through this. This has been a six-month process, but we finally chose to work with these guys. American Hartford Gold will ship physical gold and silver directly 
to your door or they can set you up on a gold IRA. If you have a retirement fund that you cannot afford to lose, now's the time to call American Hartford Gold, a precious metal dealer you can trust. They'll show you how to protect your savings and retirement accounts by diversifying your portfolio with physical gold and silver. They have the finest products, amazing customer service, and a buyback commitment. And they've earned a five-star rating from thousands of reviews and an A-plus from Better Business Bureau. Tell them I sent you, and they'll give you $5,000, up to $5,000 of free silver on your first order. Click on the link below or call 866-939-6984. That's 866-939-6984. Or text PBD to 65532. Again, 869-939-6984 or text PBD to 65532. You had a question for Charlie. I did, and you actually said the word in here uh, that I wanted to ask Charlie here. You said... American Hartford Gold has earned a five-star rating from thousands of reviews and an A-plus from the Better Business Bureau. Not given, earned. Mm. Interesting. Um, the, the question I have for you is, uh, back to our friend Ron DeSantis, um, listen, it's no secret. There's two Ps in, in politics. Well, that's the third P right there. Why people vote. It's pretty simple. It's policies mm -hmm. or personality. I mean, that's basically what it boils down to. Yes. There's no doubt that DeSantis is a policy wonk. You know, even when we sat down with him that one time uh, in that little room, it, it was actually kind of weird how he started the conversation. It was just like, all right, guys, here we go. So policy 1742 and 19 we're like, can we get a what's up just uh, to start? Hi. With, hey, guys, how we all doing? Great. You know, anything. So is it you're saying that you're, you're – uh, Calling Trump, he's picking up while he's in Tokyo, but you can't even get a text back from, well, from no, DeSantis. I, mean, I, I want to be fair. I mean, DeSantis, yeah. if I work hard enough, I can get him on the phone. Okay. But it's not easy, and it's well, not that's, immediate. That's my question. You're, you're calling Trump, he picks up. Yes. You have to work or earn uh, uh, yes. the right for him to scrap pick up. Would be yeah. Scrap yeah. it, right? would be a good word. And yeah. you talked about your text in RFK, Nikki Haley, yes. whatever you said. How much is this is just a personality flaw that he just is a mechanical policy guy and he's not doesn't have the just the personality, the ability to be like, hey, what's up, Charlie? Yeah, I'm busy. Whatever it is, how much is it a personality flaw? I, I I don't know. Here's what I can say though: is that in politics, there's kind of the macro, the thirty-five thousand media narratives, right? And then there's the what I call the whisper campaigns, which is kind of, hey, did you notice that whenever you're around that talk show host, they're kind of a jerk. And that stuff mm -hmm. adds up over time. That's a slow build. You know that, right, Patrick? That's not the stuff that's going to get the Daily Beast article. It's not the stuff that's going to get the NBC. But if you sure. do that in 500 events over a decade, that's all of a sudden a reputation starts to be developed. And then there's a mm -hmm. truth. And Governor DeSantis did have a fair amount of articles back in February, March, or April about how he just doesn't like spending time around people. Right. Well, you're in the wrong business. Uh, what? <laughs> well, and just meaning like he's. I remember this. You know, you saw the I same remember, article. I'm not uh, being we, unfair. We about, we just so yeah. we talked about it on the podcast. Yeah, and that that is 100 percent the reputation he has in a lot of grassroots circles. That it's super fast, super transactional. Now you contrast that, despite all the stereotypes. If Donald Trump walked into this room, he would make you feel like you are the only person on the planet. Yeah, he does From have that ability. The for focus, sure. the intensity, and his first thing would not be, hey, let's talk about policy 821152. Exactly. You know what he'd be doing? He'd say, Patrick, you got some really beautiful women out there. Yeah. Right? yeah. What are you running a modeling agency yeah. or something, right? You'd like to shake up. his arm and try to rip yeah. it off. No, yeah, ex exactly. <laughs> <Right>. <laughs> like, get over here. <laughs> you know, and, 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 but by the way, if you you'd have to be the most dominant in the room, right? Yeah. So in that you'd have yeah. to understand the hierarchy. Um, but how much is a personality flaw? I don't know. Here's what I could say though: that if DeSantis is going to keep up this behavior, again, he will finish third or fourth behind Vivek. Crazy. By the way, here's a story from NBC, which maybe he actually needs to read. Ron DeSantis says he wouldn't be Trump's running mate. I'm not a number two guy, right? Okay. So you may say you're not a number two guy. I'll read the whole thing. Florida Governor Ron DeSantis uh, firmly stated, I don't think so. I'm not a number two guy. When asked if he would be Donald Trump's running mate, citing his prefer preference to stay as governor because the vice presidency doesn't really have any authority. DeSantis dismissed discussions about potential running mates, asserting it is a little bit of a pr presumptuous to be doing so at this stage. His focus remains on winning early primaries for his candidacy. Despite his decision, DeSantis pledged his support for eventual GOP nominee, even if it turns out to be Trump, acknowledging Trump's significant lead in national survey with 51% of national Republican primary vote, which is good to hear that. But here's the point. Y you know, sometimes, like, 
this happens in sports where you're the best high school ball player. And then you're like, dude, I'm just, I'm, I'm, I'm a dog, you know, like, okay, great. Then you go to college. You're like, oh shit, I suck. <laughs> then your, your senior, you're, you're actually the best player on the team. Like, no, I'm a dumb, I'm making it. And you go to NBA and you're like, you know what? I'm the best six man. Mm-hmm. I'm a good six man. I'm not, I'm actually not who I thought I was. I'm Lamar Odom. I'm the six man of the year. You're Lou okay? Williams. B- by the way, there is nothing wrong with that. Okay, there's nothing wrong with that. You're a guy that comes yes. and gets the job done. Or here's the part, very interesting. Russell Westbrook, does he have a ring? No, no. he's not a number one guy. Chris Paul, does he have a ring? He's not a number one guy. Yep. Paul George, does he have a ring? He's not a number one guy. You know what he said on his podcast? He says, I finally come to a conclusion to realize I will never win a championship as a number one. And Paul George is a dog. Yep. He's not a regular guy. So what does this mean? Here's what it means. There's two things with uh, Governor DeSantis. I'll say this and I'll, I'll turn it over to you. Is one, <clears throat> sometimes you may be number one in policies. You may be number one in running a state. You may be number one in all that stuff, but you're not a number one marketer. Maybe the best thing he could do, and I'm telling you guys right now, the best thing he could do is if he can figure out a way to be around a guy who is possibly the greatest marketer, who won on TV, who won on politics, and who won in business, who won in real estate in New York where you're negotiating air. <laughs> you go and spend four years on the, under this guy, you know what you're going to learn after four years? Not policies. You're going to send to him just like everybody sizes each other up. They'll say, yeah, I'm better than him in that. I'm, I'm definitely better than him in that policy. He's wrong about that policy. That's not true. Oh, shit. I can't do that. Mm-hmm. Yeah. And you can't do that, Ron. That's marketing. And to win at that level... You need that. What are your thoughts on that? He believes he's better than Trump, though. He 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 does not believe there's a lot to learn there. That's and, very positive. Good for you. But I, the world has to believe that. Well, but also, I mean, like you just said it best. I mean, you negotiate the air rights over Tiffany's. That's a skill set that is a lot different than navigating the all red <laughs> Florida legislature. Like a lot. <laughs> different, right. I mean, and so yeah. here's the thing. In politics, you have to read the room. And so you know this in sales, right, Patrick? I mean, you, I'm blown away by what you do with you know PHP, all that, and I can't wait to come speak in August with you guys, is that when you teach salespeople, you let the customer talk first. Or else you're just, it, it, it would be like going to a bunch of Jewish rabbis, be like, yeah, you know, I sell BLTs. Like, okay, that's, 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 they're, they're not going to buy bacon from you, okay? It's against their deeply held <laughs> beliefs. Yeah. It would have been helpful if you knew that they were, you know, Orthodox Jewish rabbis before you open your mouth. Not in the bacon business. Those yeah. Rabbis, so, but no. but Ron DeSantis is going into the Republican base and not even first asking the question of what they want. Instead, he's like, "Let me tell you what you want." Mm-hmm. Okay. No. 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 You, you're misreading the room. the The Republican base right now is a base that wants a resurgence of economic nationalism. They want their country back. They're sick of this trans zealotry. More than anything else, though, they want a president who's a bulldog. They want a UFC fighter. They want someone to get into the ring, willing to bloody up the opposition and settle the score, literally because they feel like they are being blitzkrieged and pummeled every single day. Now, to your point, Patrick, yes, if you're trying to create a roster to save Western civilization, someone's going to be Jordan. And until Jordan retires, yes, you need a Pippen, you need a Kukoc, you need a Kerr, and you need a Rodman. Where does DeSantis fall on all that? Probably like Steve Kerr, like role Ooh, player. But, yeah. No, no, but like they don't they, they don't win the fifth title without Steve Kerr. Like they just don't. Well, Steve Kerr was a shooting threes all was day. A, was a hold, fifth six yeah. man. Hold is on what a you're second. Saying. Yeah, he was a role player. I'm, I'm saying like right now in no, no, politics. I, I'm with you. But then Steve Kerr, when his number was called, Michael Jordan whispered in the huddle like, "Yo, yo, Steve, yo, Steve, I might come to you." Yeah. Right. Game six, I believe. Boom. Dishes to Steve Kerr. Hits it with seven seconds left, and they win the fifth title. Right. That was necessary and proper, but he understood his role. And Steve Kerr said in The Last Dance, I always knew I was not going to be a one guy, so I had to scrap for my position. Now, you might say, oh, well, maybe Ron DeSantis is Pippen or Rodman. We can only play the metaphor out so far. But right now, Ron DeSantis is a governor of one state. Mm -hmm. He wants to be president of 50 and the leader of the free world. You're going up against Jordan, man. You're going up against a guy that has succeeded in everything he's done. And in my personal opinion was not given a fair shake in the 2020 election. So it's unfair to say like, oh, you know, we're necessarily going to lose. Like, come on, let's be honest. That election was a drive-by shooting of the U.S. Constitution, mail-in drop boxes, social media in- interference, the Twitter files, COVID. all that stuff, COVID, all that stuff, right? So the, a Republican base also believes rightly 
that Donald Trump has not had a fair shake at governance or re-election since the moment he won the 2016 election. And they're right. Spied on his campaign, Russia hoax, two impeachments. Yeah. Yo, you, earlier you used the word scorned. I right? used that you word said they want a pit bull, they want a fighter. Yes. Explain, if you could, just extrapolate, why are they feel scorned metaphysically? No, the, like, the, not the, just this is a great question, yeah. right? I get this question asked by establishment donors, which I'm on good terms with, where they ask me like almost as if I'm some sort of like translator. Help me understand the yeah. deplorable people in Arkansas. Okay. <laughs> they have shown up and vote, voted. They show up to church. They raise their kids. They pay their taxes. They've done what they've been told to do. And they've lived largely virtuous good lives for 40 years. And they've seen their country decline. But they've constantly elected Republicans to see their country collapse. And they've more specifically got behind smooth-talking, slick, well-funded Republicans, Mitt Romney, Paul Ryan, Mitch McConnell, John Boehner, and many others that have told them, just give us political power and things are going to get better. And they do not see the border getting closed. They do not see the, bal the budget getting balanced. They do not see top priorities of ordinary, everyday Americans start to get accomplished. So they start to create a sense of scorn, paranoia, neuroticism, or just like understanding, understandable skepticism, which where I'm at, mm -hmm. where the first instinct of a Republican-based voter is, I think you are lying to me until you prove me otherwise. Charlie, I think what you're saying is, is paramount for people to understand and hear the words that you're actually saying. And I just like, oh, a talking point. It's super important that you're saying that. You know, Bill Maher always says it's okay for you to hate Trump, but you can't hate the people that voted for him. 100%. These people, you have to understand their DNA. If they feel scorned, they don't care that he calls someone Little Marco or Low Energy no, Jeb. They, they kind of like they it. They feel fucking pissed yes. and scorned. And so, but let me just reemphasize this. They're not wrong. Like for 40 right. years, we've shipped our jobs overseas and we invade a country every two years. We're financing foreign thuggish governments in Ukraine with Zelensky, while our own border continues to be wide open. We have 110,000 drug overdoses every single year, and I have to be lectured by the CIA and the FBI and the Uniparty that the Ukrainian government is my responsibility. Like, no, screw you. I don't care about Zelensky. Mm -hmm. I care about the 110,000 fellow Americans that are drug overdosing every single year. I care that middle-class wages are going down and that we have the most suicidal drug addicted, alcohol addicted, depressed and porn pornographic addicted generation in history. And so Trump recalibrates everything and says, no, no, no. When the plane is going down, you put on your oxygen mask first, then you can go to the Somali immigrant and go put their oxygen mask on. Yeah. That is a very simple, prudent approach. The other politicians re reject that philosophically. By the way, th 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 this is one thing to keep in mind while all this stuff is going on. Just a few months ago, I don't know, maybe eight months ago, everybody's like, well, Musk is for DeSantis. Rogan uh -huh. is for DeSantis. Ken Griffin from Citadel is for DeSantis. Mega donor Ken Griffin is evaluating the GOP primary field but remains silent on his contribution to pro DeSantis entities like the Never Back Down Super PAC. Griffin has previously expressed support for DeSantis, who received $100 million from Griffin in 2022 midterms. DeSantis' campaign highlights his fundraising success with $150 million raised overall, including an $82.5 million transfer from a state-level political committee. So what happens when these bigger donors are pulling away? Don't be surprised if one of two things happen. If they try to draft like a Glenn Youngkin to into the race as kind of the counter to Trump and or another one of these candidates kind of starts to get the anointing to go against Trump. Look, maybe Tim Scott is probably the next one. He, he doesn't have a snowball chance in hell to beat. The, I actually like Tim Scott. I think he's a pleasant person. He's been really sweet to me and I just disagree with him on a lot of stuff and he's not the fighter the base wants. But yeah, the, the, I hear this because I talk to a lot of these donors and, and they know where I stand, but I also have a mission at Turning Point USA, an educational mission that is in wide agreement with a lot of donors, right? So I, I strike that balance, I think, pretty well. But Patrick, call after call I receive from people that are so upset with DeSantis and underwhelmed by how he's doing, and they are seeking other options. And because DeSantis was supposed to be the guy that could successfully challenge Trump, and that is not materializing. And by the way, time is running out. Do you think it's too late? No. Do you, th do you well, think it's too late? Well, so who, who am I to give advice to, you know, against Trump? Because everyone knows where my, you know, where my loyalties lie. But no, it's not too late. However, it's increasingly unlikely. It's a 99. If you were like the bookie, like to kind of do the odds, it's a 99% chance Trump wins the nomination. Absent something, a black swan event that we are not expecting, 
because the indictments are only helping. The more that stuff is in the news, Jack Smith might as well be the campaign chairman of the Donald J. Trump super PAC. It, it only helps invigorate the Republican base to play into the core theme of Donald Trump, which is they need to take me out because I'm a threat to the system. So, so, so try, try, uh, sorry to cut you off, Pat. So <clears throat> Christopher Ray was in, in Congress yesterday. Yep. Not answering any questions, everything from, you know, January 6th to Russia. Everything was it's still under investigation. They're asking about Hunter. They're asking about uh, Joe Biden. Everything. There's no answers ever, Charlie. So let's say Trump does win because I think he's going to get the nomination. Let's say he wins the presidency. The DOJ, FBI, we yep. had to talk about this on one podcast, Pat. From what I would say, 95% left Democrat. Like, yep. what are they going to do? Like, does he even, once he's in, Charlie, are we going to have to deal with all this crap all no, over I mean, again, like what? he's making promises. So there's this, there's a thing called Schedule F where you're allowed if you sign Schedule F as president, you could just fire any executive branch employee at will. Now, Trump, it, because of how they're treating him, if by some miraculous intervention, he's able to actually become president again. Yeah, y- you are going to see one of the most motivated executives to reform the <laughs> Leviathan. You're and, fired. You're fired. Oh, I mean, it, 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 but it's going to be a bloodbath. Now yeah. you say, well, why didn't he do that in the first term? Yeah. He wanted to, but he was really handcuffed by a lot of double talk and misleading people that say, we don't do that around here. You know, that's not how it works. But you must understand also the context. From the moment Donald Trump took the presidency, Peter Strzok Stroke Smirk was in the White House, entrapped Lieutenant General Michael Flynn. He was under the Mueller stuff, under the Russia stuff. Chuck Schumer, in January of 2017, before Donald Trump became president, sat on the Rachel Maddow program, said this, the, the Central Intelligence Agency has six ways to Sunday of getting back at you. And for supposedly a very shrewd businessman, you're not being very smart to go after the in- intel agencies. So they, they set his his first term up. And here he is. He doesn't even know where the pen drawer is in the resolute desk. And he's dealing with impeachment inquiries and Mueller stuff and Paul Ryan's against him. So a second term, in some ways, you know, there's only been one president that has served, uh, you know, non-consecutive terms, Grover Cleveland. And so he almost has this breather to come in with like a fire breathing mandate, which he speak. He's not just like alluding to it. He's being as blunt as blunt can be in his policy speeches and his rallies of what he plans to do. And look, going after the administrative state, again, I will repeat, is the existential threat to our liberty. The promise of the American founding is representative three-branch government, not unrepresentative shadow leviathan fourth-branch bureaucracies running our life. I, I want you, you brought up Ray, right? What yeah. happened to him with the FBI? Check this out. So here's Matt. I want, I want to show a series of three things. The first one is Matt Gates with Ray, okay, director of FBI. Then it's Jim Jordan. Then it's Chris Christie responding to this. So go ahead and plus the first one uh, 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 with Gates. I'm sitting here with my father. I will make certain that between the man sitting next to me and every person he knows and my ability to forever hold a grudge, that you will regret not following my direction. I am sitting here waiting for the call with my father. Sounds like a shakedown, doesn't it, Director? I'm not going to get into commenting on that. You, you, You seem deeply uncurious about it, don't you? Almost suspiciously uncurious. Are you protecting the Bidens? A- absolutely not. The FBI well, you does won't not the has que- no oh, hold interest on. in You won't answer the question about whether or not that's a shakedown, and everybody knows why you won't answer it. Because to, ev- to the millions of people who will see this, they know it is. And your inability to acknowledge that is deeply revealing about you. But okay, so that's the first one, right? Wow. Straight up calls him out. <laughs> yes. Now watch Jim Jordan. Because love it. on this one, that. Ray starts, then Jim finishes. So look what he says. Really, any company of any size in China uh, is required, required by Chinese law to have what they uh, quaintly call a committee, which is essentially a cell inside the company whose sole function is to ensure that company's compliance with Chinese Communist Party orthodoxy. If we tried to install something like that in American companies or if the British tried to do it in British companies or any number of other places, People would go out of their minds, and rightly so. Agreed. Well, thank you. Uh, I'd like to work with you more on that, and I'd uh, yield the balance of my time to the chairman. Thank you. But that's exactly what you did. <laughs> and the judge said it last week. Every week you were meeting with big tech companies saying, hey, look at this. This violates your policy. Take this speech of Americans down. You were doing the same darn thing you just described to Chinese about. Really, Pretty wild, I right? Love see that. That. And I love watch, watch Chris Christie, what he says about this and, and, and how he builds this up. Go ahead. Jim Comey and Eric Holder and Loretta Lynch 
drastically harmed the Department of Justice and the FBI. And Chris Ray has now spent years fixing that. Um, now, are there going to be Chris disagreements? Ray's of course, there are always going to be disagreements between Congress and the executive branch. And they would like more information, and he's got obligations under grand jury rules to, to not give everything they want to give. But I will tell you something. What you saw today, I think, was an animated and combative <laughs> FBI director who's defending the men and women who work for him oh, every God. day and do a great job and protect us from domestic terrorism, <laughs> from international terrorism, and from these drug cartels, and are helping state and local law enforcement every day with their things. So, yeah, I, I, I think Chris Ray has done a very good job. And I think, look, a lot of the stuff you see today, John, is theater, um, the people trying to raise money for campaigns. doesn't mean there aren't problems at the FBI. There are. But I believe Chris is a guy who can get him fixed, and he's fixed a lot of them already. What, what, what do you think about this whole, you know, Chris Ray? Uh, For, forget about Chris Christie, because what I want to know about you afterwards is uh, with him, what his play is. But what do you think about what's going on with Ray and— uh, Oh, I mean, Chris Ray is an embodiment of the toxin that is currently eroding the United States Constitution. No one voted for Chris Ray. He didn't have to go to Iowa and convince people to give him power. He has a 10-year term to run a secret police against political dissidents they don't like. So Chris Christie aside, because he's he's an overweight sideshow, the the, 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 the the core of this that needs to be focused and emphasized is what has the FBI done recently? Not just going after political dissidents, Donald Trump, not just going after Steve Bannon, not going after Dinesh D'Souza a couple years ago, also Rudy Giuliani, going after... You know, the we build the wall people, parents going, going after parents <laughs> and calling them domestic terrorists, not just having tabletop exercises at the Aspen Institute in preparation of the 2020 election, having standing meetings at Twitter with Yoel Roth demanding censorship, going preemptively to Mark Zuckerberg and doing a shakedown saying that, hey, there might be some Russian disinformation that you might have to censor. Christopher Ray was the architect of all of this and continues to be it. So. The, the question is, do we actually still have a, a semblance of a representative government? In some senses, yes. In some senses, no. And why is that? You know, the lack of accountability the media presents towards the administrative state is glaring, and I'll prove it to you. I had to watch some CBS or NBC uh, for, or some stupid, like, we, why we need to be supporting Ukraine war type thing. And... They were saying, okay, we're coming up on like the year and a half mark. And they said, you know, the Russian government is so tyrannical because they put their political dissidents in prison and they put journalists in prison. It's like, oh, really? You mean like raiding James O'Keefe's home? Or like trying to put Donald Trump in 200 years in prison? Like, yeah, I don't know a government that would do such a thing as that. Like everything that we criticize the Russian government for, the Kremlin, our government is doing times 10 against our own political dissidents. And so why is this? I blame Republicans for a lot of this. Lindsey Graham and a lot of people post 9-11, they, they, they transform the FBI from a law enforcement agency into an intelligence agency. And those are two distinctly different things. A law enforcement agency does not preemptively try to monitor or surveil or spy on American citizens to try to find a crime. A law enforcement agency follows leads to then hold people accountable if you're doing something illegal. Let's go all the way back. J. Edgar Hoover was a total freak, by the way. So, you know, the, the FBI never should have been formed as it was. It was supposed to stop interstate bank trafficking and maybe human smuggling. And so post 9-11, who did this? Bob Mueller was head of the FBI. When this ended up happening, he made the switch. And George W. Bush and Dick Cheney and Lindsey Graham and Denny Hassert and every and Mitch McConnell, every one of these neocons, because of the panic of 9-11, Republican voters, unfortunately, were largely in support of giving away our God-given civil liberties and freedoms to Department of Homeland Security, CISA, FBI, because we were afraid of radical Islamic terrorism. Guess what? That was a real thing. But we, cert we soon realized there was a supply and demand problem with radical Islamic terrorism. Mm -hmm. There just wasn't that much in the American homeland. And so then all of a sudden they started twiddling their thumbs and they have these tens of billions of dollars of budgets. Barack Obama becomes president and a whisper campaign starts and says, huh, what if the real terrorism is white Christian nationalists in Iowa? What if the real terrorists are the people that are the QAnon extremists and what is now turned in the FBI from what was once trying to be a preventative measure to stop 9-11 from happening is now a massive 50 to $70 billion agency that we know of. It's probably even bigger than that. That is targeted against half the country and their values. Don't believe me? The FBI is infiltrating Latin mass 
Literally, they're going into Catholic Latin masses because mm. they're considered to be. You can look up that story, they, and it whistleblower after whistleblower says the FBI currently has undercover agents going to Catholic Latin mass. That we, Patrick, I go around the country and people ask me, Charlie, when are we going to become the Soviet Union? I'm like newsflash, our government has become the Soviet Union. This is exactly how the secret police under Stalin operated, and Christopher Ray is the grand maestro of this. And the he, think about how silly this is. If the House of Representatives were to hold him in contempt, where does that contempt charge go? To him. So he would have to go indict himself. So how do you how do you fix this? I fully support the calls to break up and abolish the FBI and turn it into 10 or 12 different micro agencies against legitimate like child sex trafficking or human smuggling or bank crimes. 90% of what the FBI does right now is politically driven investigations and surveillance and not to mention the FISA, you can look up the other article, the the, the, the amount of FISA abuse, F-I-S-A. Was it a million, Charlie? It was yeah, like a million that's exactly right. illegal FISA FISAs. That's right. If you go to, there was a recent, FISA, I think it was the statement of either Michael Horowitz or something. There was a recent report that shows that a million times they broke the law. So Patrick, you and I don't break the law. We go to jail unless we're Hunter Biden or we're, you know, left-wing <laughs> yeah, Democrat. Yeah, untouchable. What happens when the government breaks the law? Yeah. Nothing. Charlie... FBI, they get raises in private jets and bigger buildings. Yeah. FBI, Christopher Ray, appointed by Trump in 2017. This is a this is a legitimate point. Yeah. I mean, that's the point. How much do you think Trump regrets being the person that tapped Ray to be the FBI director? Look, I can't I can't speak for his level of regret. I, I think there's a fair amount of fury because now the very people he put into office are now trying to put him in prison for 200 years. Person Think about that for a second, right? I mean, some people get lost in the nuance right there. The guy that he picked yes. to be the director of the FBI is now the guy that's trying to put Trump in prison. Think about that. That's like you picking the new CFO of PHP, and now he's trying to usurp you to take your job, put you in prison. And, it's and insane. So, so this, there's a lot of reasons why the personnel of the Trump White House was, as even Rush Limbaugh would say, puzzling. Yeah. And Rush never Especially, said something. Yeah, he yeah. never said something negative about Trump. Yeah. yeah. And he said, uh, <laughs> it's very puzzling. Yeah. Like what a Rush term, right? Yeah. Mm -hmm. it, and this is why. And, and it goes back to why they hate Trump so much, why they have to throw him in prison, why they're doing all this, is he was not supposed to win. No one thought he was going to win. There was no prep. There was no transition team. So you go from a guy that's on 1% probability meter on the New York Times website to all of a sudden president-elect. So all of a sudden, out of nowhere, who comes in? The, the people, The worst people come in. Right, Put right in the Trump Tower the next day, mm -hmm. you had people taking the 6 a.m. flight out of Washington, D.C., flattering Trump, being like, these people are going to be amazing in your White House. They were sleeper cells for the shadow government. Well, that how much of it is on Trump? And I'm not here to, like, because, hear me out. Let I'm him make his point. He's making a point. Oh, I want to hear what he was going to oh, say. I don't I, think he was done. Oh. You were saying how much of this is on the sleeper? Uh, uh, yeah, look— I, I think we could all Monday morning quarterback. I think he fully acknowledges that he could have made better personnel selections in certain places. I, I, I will say this is that he was so deceived by the people closest to him. I mean, how many people do we have to go through from John Bolton to Kelly to Amarosa that turned into like Brutus Cassius Judas, right? Mm -hmm. It was like how many Brutus Cassius Judas archetypes were trolling around that place? Look, I, 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 you're, you're not going to get me to say something negative about like Trump, how much is on Trump or not. I think it needs to be the number one place of improvement because from Burks to yeah. Fauci, th those people never should have been around uh, the White th House. This isn't a, a gotcha. Hey, Charlie. I'm no, 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 no. I'm, I'm just no, being honest. I, I'm like, actually I'm, trying to be constructive here, to be honest with you, because he marketed himself as I'm going to hire the best people. I'm going to have the best people around yep. me. That was his selling point. How much has he learned? And if he is the the next president of the United yes, States, which he can, who's he going to hire? Yeah, that uh, it this doesn't happen again. So thankfully, there's a guy named John McEntee. He's publicly working on this. He was the best guy in the White House. He got so much done. He was Trump's body guy and kind of became de facto personnel chief. And he's already putting it together in conjunction with the Heritage Foundation. They're working on this. I'm not that interested in that because that's just not my skill set. I mean, we're happy to send resumes and stuff. I just want to win. And because if you don't win, then who cares about your transition project? But the number one, and by the way, the number one policy objection that the base has to Donald Trump was his personnel, right? And, but think about it. You're a once in a 100 year wrecking ball that was once, you go from New York City developer and talk show personality, cable personality to president of the United States. 
Like, you don't have a tickler file of personnel to, like, go run the Department of Interior, right? Right. And he wasn't wrong. Like, when he ran his businesses in New York, he did have the best people. But he was able to fire them on demand, and they were motivated by one thing, profit. So he was operating under a system where the people wanted to get paychecks. They wanted to get bonuses. That's not how DC works at all. It's not a profit system. It's patronage. It's access. It's favors. Mm -hmm. It's one-off deals. It's deceit. So in markets, you know this, Patrick, from building an unbelievably successful business, markets, you, ha you cannot lie in a market in the sense of you either make money or you don't make money. In D.C., it's nothing but lying. House of Cards. It, yeah. it, 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 and by the way, that is 100% how it operates. It's blackmail. It's backroom deals. And here he is. He's like, what the hell is this? Like, let's just build the wall. And then people are leaking on him, right? People are talking negatively about him. And not to mention, again, some people don't like it when they say, oh, Trump is always the victim and all this. Stop it. You had within a week the FBI with Peter Strzok in the White House illegally entrapping the national security advisor. That is in clearest terms the administrative state that was going after the will of the sovereign people. What played out in the first Trump term from the first impeachment, was, which was an illegally listened to phone call. We forget. It was Eric Schmarello who leaked a national security phone call. Who did Donald Trump have that call with? Zelensky. Mm -hmm. People forget. That was Donald Trump's call with Zelensky that Eric Schmarello was illegally leaked. How about the, sec the second impeachment was January 6th? Separate issue. But COVID, lockdowns, Fauci's lies, Burke's lies, fear-mongering, death tolls on TV, CNN, everyone is going to die. You know, Lancet study, it's going to wipe out 30% of the population. You know, hydroxychloroquine, ivermectin, vitamin D levels, IV, can't talk about any of that stuff. Social media censorship. Donald Trump owns shares in ivermectin. It's a horse drug. Go after Joe Rogan. I mean, has anyone ever had that kind of multi-institutional attack at him? And he still only, I use the word loss very carefully, he was not president by 8,000 votes in Arizona, like 10,000 votes in Arizona, 12,000 in Georgia, and 20,000 in Wisconsin. That's remarkable. They, they're they afraid they can't do 2020 again. And that in 2024, absent indictments or other interference, this guy actually might be president again. Because they're right, he might. That's a scary thought for them if that oh, happens. no, it's That's terrifying. A, this is why Jack yeah. Smith is acting like he's a Nazi war criminal. Right. Um, you remember when the, the, the day when Trump won and beat Hillary and everybody's looked at the video, you know, the one main video, everybody <laughs> crying, the girls I, crying. I mean, I, I'm sorry. I found joy in that. Video. I, I'm sure I you do. I to go to sleep. But I, but I have a feeling it's going to be that time <laughs> That times ten, if it happens in twenty four. But uh, Rob, can you can you pull up the story on, on California, well, Vinny? You were talking about the story. You know which one I'm talking about? California Assembly Committee yep. black, uh, blocks bill that could have sent human traffickers to kids of kids to prison for life. And if you go a little lower, you know, California got it. The Golden State Lower House Committee Senate Bill fourteen, which would make human trafficking for children a, a, a serious felony. The serious felony charges under California law currently include murder, rape, and any other crime which may incur in the death penalty or life sentence in the state prison. However, instead of upping the ante on child traffickers, the California Assembly Public Safety yep. Committee nuked the measure on Tuesday. How wild is that? And, and they don't just nuke it on any week. They nuke it on the week Weird. of the movie Sound of Freedom coming out that beats... Uh, Harrison Ford's movie, Indiana, you know, Indiana, Indiana, Jones. Indiana Jones, and it was ah, you know, it's just a, you know, it's a, not a real story. It's just a, you know, a bunch of different things, in, inaccurate facts. What, what is like, what is a newsome thinking when stuff like this is passing in his state? How do you sell I, I, this? I, How do you sell this to parents? I, I don't think he cares because California is so ridiculously Democrat that he's never going to be held accountable. But I mean, you know, Patrick, you have really broad-based appeal. I encourage the next Democrat you have on the show. Just like ask them a very simple question, which is like, I know you hate Trump. I know you have to reflexively oppose everything the American right focuses on, right? Like everything. But do you really have to do that when it comes to child sex trafficking? Like, can you check your like pathological type opposition to all things right wing and just maybe like mm -hmm. just lay down your arms for, I don't know, one issue, like just one issue. Yeah. Can you just like take it easy? I mean, Rolling Stone, Guardian. QAnon adjacent film seducing America. That was the Rolling Stone headline. Go, or that might have been the Guardian. Or the Rolling Stone and Guardian yeah, had two. Yeah, but that was the title. That, that you was, are that, correct. That, that Miles Clee. Miles yeah. Clee for Rolling Stone. Yeah, and so maybe you could just like take an afternoon off. I mean, you guys love doing weed a lot. Like, why don't you just like smoke weed and like yeah. take like this is not a necessary article for you to publish, right? Sound of Freedom is a superhero movie for dads with brain worms. <laughs> like, okay, that's RollingStone.com. 
first of all, it's a true story. It's a heroic story. It's a beautiful film. It's really successful. Maybe we could all agree that, okay, we have different politics, but I don't know, like moving children across state lines and prostituting them for rape and for money is probably evil. Like, no, you're queuing on. Well, well, hold on. Like, like, do you understand what you're doing? Yeah. I mean, can you break out of your muscle memory automatic opposition that if someone on the right says something, I must oppose it? I try my best to do this, right? To not do this, right? If I see something on the left, like if Bobby Kennedy says something I like, I'm going to speak out. I encourage everyone in the audience, regardless of your politics, this right here is the most destructive operating behavior in the entire country. And when people on the right do it, it's bad. People on the left, people on the right don't do it as much. They just don't. Because I, I think they tend to be more intellectually honest because they have to constantly prove their their stances and beliefs. But this right here, what what, what <laughs> does this accomplish? Where you're bashing a movie that eight years ago, Patrick, 10 years ago, the country that we used to have 10 years ago, yeah. people be like, oh, cool film. Let's go bring our families. But now it instantly has to politicize things. And people say, oh, Charlie, why are we so divided? Because Rolling Stone politicizes things that should have widespread agreement unless you're a pedophile. Unless you are a pedophile. And I'm not suggesting this author is, but unless you are a pedophile, you should probably support Sound of Freedom. Charlie, you're one million percent right in what you're saying. And I saw the movie last night. You saw it a week ago, less than a week ago. You recommended I just saw it. it. We talked I just about saw this it. the other day with Lauren Chen. Yep. Uh, and I, there's probably someone up on an upcoming podcast, possibly this weekend, that we can even bring this up to. Um, but you're absolutely right. I'm in downtown Miami, not exactly far right wing, you know, MAGA country, not exactly far left either, no, it's, Cuban it's community, a, it's Republican, a, it's a great, beautiful, very city. purple city yeah, here in Miami. Great. Terrific place. All sorts of shapes and colors are at the movie. Everyone jaws dropped, yes. shocked, holy shit. So if I didn't know about the headlines ahead of time, now that I'm seeing these headlines as just a reasonable, moderate person, I'm like, what the fuck are they thinking? <laughs> what is... Uh, Dads with brain worms, QAnon, it's a movie of vilified, disgusting, vile people and it, trafficking which, which does children happen. Yes. and selling them into sexual slavery, period, full stop. Yes, this is not a political it, it agenda, be political. nothing. And so, but Rolling Stone is like attacking us as dads with brain worms. Look at a QAnon tinged thriller. So, do you know that Miles Cleese? A, he's a weirdo, by the way. They they like they showed up photos of his of his uh, of his profile. But you know you know what's crazy in this situation? The left doesn't care. Do you know who does care, Charlie? Criminals, like people that are in jail. Like Larry Nasser just got stabbed six times. Like the ex uh, gymnastics mm -hmm. guy. These people don't give a shit, but criminals who are in there for, you know, beating people up or, or burglary, they find your ass and they hold well, you accountable. And, and, and that, that goes to show exactly what Aristotle argued, which that there's a hierarchy to the good and there's a hierarchy to the bad, yeah. right? And even if someone's like in jail for embezzling money or like they even know the most vile scum are the pedophiles and oh, the yeah. traffickers. So you think about it, like you make a really interesting point. Yeah. Prisoners, and again, I'm not defending the stabbing of Larry Nasser. Me, me neither. Shouldn't but happen. But he, he is the scum of the earth and I believe he'll go into the fire of hell unless he repents in front of Jesus Christ, our Lord and Savior. I really believe that. But like even they are like, no. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Like, okay, I might've, I don't know, shot up like a drive-by shooting or like robbed the bank. <laughs> or robbed the bank. <laughs> but don't mess with the kids. No. And, yep. Yeah. So let me, the, the morality of a prison gang is clear in the morality of Rolling Stone. Wow. Yes. Brilliant. And I've heard, that, that, I've heard that You're multiple right. times from people who I know have been no, in that, and out. That is like the like strongest they, point I've heard. <laughs> they'll if, kill you. If they find out that's the reason you're in jail, oh. not murder. You're dead. No. You're dead. Not, not criminal activity. Not, no. None of that. They find out that you're raping children, they will come for you in prison. And, okay. and mind you, you know what you know what the story was, uh, Charlie. That he, Larry Nasser, was in the prison and Wimbledon. They wanted to watch Wim Wimbledon. He's like, let's put on the women's, and the guy stabbed the shit out of them. So I salute that guy. I well, don't care. I, I, he got to get paid. Yeah. I, I don't support the you know vigilante stabbing of people right. in prisons. However, I will say this: prisons are. I don't know how deep you want to go into this. Prisons are super interesting pictures into the state of nature, right? So. We're always asking, like, what are people like in their natural habitat? So, what does prison have? Well, you don't have to work. You have all your meals provided for you. You have room and board. So what happens in prison? People naturally associated with people who look like them. So we're naturally tribal people, right? You naturally form into communities where you other the other people. That's also for survival in many cases. No, no, of course it is. Yes. But it also just happens without any sort of central planning, yes. right? Whites with whites, Hispanics with Hispanics, blacks with blacks. I'm not defending it. It's just interesting from an ob observational standpoint. Yeah. But also that there's a, there's a moral code that comes in 
or even the people who are locked up for life that have done things that we would consider to be against civil society standards, they say, nah, that in the state of nature, you do not need to go to Harvard to know. You don't need to go to Stanford to know yes. that raping children is evil. Even the bad people know that is exactly. what you're saying. Well, no, basically. Like, even in the state of nature, like reduce down the person that you and I would be like, okay, like you shouldn't have robbed those 30 cars like or whatever you did, yes. right? They then they, they have a line that thou shall not what a cross. Point. I love yes. that. What a point, right? When you think about that. Mm -hmm. Like, listen, th there's a there's a certain moral code. You did that, no problem. Everybody gangs up against you. Everybody. Yes. But that in the state of nature, what it goes to show is that there's something fundamental in our soul that says children are off limits. And yet Rolling Stone does not yeah. subscribe to that. <laughs> You're saying there's a hierarchy of evil, and that's no, at the top there, of the no, of course, list. I, I believe in gradations. The better word is gradations, right? Gradations of sins. That, that, for example, stealing a pencil is nowhere near raping a child. Like, it's different universes. I believe yeah. that epistemologically sure. and theologically and religiously. And I think we all agree that morally. But with, I just, I just want to reemphasize the point that the prison gang is thinking more clearly in terms of good or evil or right and wrong than the mainstream. And, and, and by the way, and if it's the male sex offenders, look how they're wired. Look at these guys. This is a Telegraph story. Male sex offenders faking trans identities to to move to women's prison. Brilliant. Okay. <laughs> Research backed by Ministry of Justice suggests that male sex offenders are pretending to be transgender in order to be transferred to women's prisons. Inmates who fake transitioning see it as a way to lower their risk and secure a place in female prison state. There were 168 legally male trans women prisoners in England and Wales, with only six in women's prisons and the remainder in men's prisons. Men jailed for sexual offenses are twice as likely to identify as trans women who than uh, uh, those jailed for other types of offenses. The Ministry of Justice has introduced stricter rulers, rules after the controversy surrounding the placement of a transgender convict uh, uh, convicted of raping two women in an all-female prison. <laughs> the study reveals concerns about fakers posing a threat to reputation of genuine transgender prisons, prisoners and limit resources available in custody. You know what this is? <laughs> Bad policies eventually get exposed. Hypocrisy gets exposed. And now they have to sit there and try to argue and defend this, and they can't. How are you going to defend this? You, you can't defend an argument like this. What do you think about when you hear a story like this? Oh, I mean, look, I have very strong opinions on the trans thing, but it's not going to stop, right? I mean, so, of course they're going to fake. Well, first of all, the headline says male sex offenders faking trans identities. All trans identities are fake. <laughs> <laughs> so I don't understand what you mean faking. Like, it's all fake. You're not, you're, not, you're not what you wish to be. You are what you are, okay? Such a good point. So, but yeah, I mean, so they're trying, I mean... This, this this old idea used to be kind of a joke, right, of, oh, yeah, I would be want to become a woman so I could go in the female locker room. Well, it's not a joke. It's now policy. And this is a social contagion. I don't fall under this, and you guys obviously don't. I hope not either, which is, are you going to reaccommodate all of society for people's deep-seated mental problems? No, that's a really bad idea. You should not change customs. You should not change rules. You should not change protections of the innocent or women because people are having issues with their own existence or their own identity, period. And yet we're seeing that not just in prisons, but in sports and in schools. And so you could tell a lot by a society about what do people do with power? Okay, so if you're in charge of a society, do you use that power to protect people that are not as strong as you? Yeah. Or do you use that power to then terrorize people that are not as strong as you? Almost every society that has ever existed uses power for tyranny or authoritarian means. The West was built on this idea that we are going to intervene to protect those that can't protect themselves. It's a profound idea. It's a Christian idea, right? That I care about my neighbor. Treat your, you know, love your neighbor as yourself. Leviticus 19. Jesus said, you could, you, the two most important things, love the Lord your God with all your heart, soul, strength, and mind, and then treat, love your neighbor as yourself. That teaching built the West. Love your neighbor as yourself. Therefore, if there's someone, for example, in a wheelchair and somebody goes by and just like throws them onto the street, you should go to jail for that. Like that. But you look at it through a Darwinistic secular lens. Why? Why not? What's wrong with that? Survival of the fittest. Like, no, you should not be able to use your power to exploit, harm, damage somebody that does not have the same, same strength as you. Mm. In fact, it's morally incumbent on the people who do have the strength. I use strength as a broad term, not just physical strength, but I do mean it in this sense. And yes, men are stronger than women. There are some women that are stronger than men, but generally, bone density, testosterone, muscle mass, like we really have to prove this mm -hmm. right now. So 
Don't be surprised when male predators that have deep-seated mental problems want to go into women's prisons to rape them. And get them pregnant. There was there was an issue a couple months that, ago. They were getting them pregnant. But it, it's just like this. It, I mean, again, we live in Narnia in some ways. It's like this really <laughs> weird existence where five years ago, Patrick, when you and I sat down at Turning Point USA's Young Women's Leadership Summit, I had a, I, like these feminazis were screaming in my ear about, oh my gosh, men are around the corner, always wanting to rape me, and Kavanaugh's a gang rapist, and everyone's Harvey Weinstein. And five years later, they're like, but if Harvey Weinstein adef- identifies as a woman... Progress. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. But, but here's, a, here's a question for everybody here. So all, all of us here. So you know how you just said five years ago trans wasn't a thing, right? And we're not it talking there, about it. but it wasn't what it is It's now. not what it is today, right? Okay. So, you know, women's sports. You saw – can you pull up the picture about the uh, – what was it? The the Netherlands woman. Uh, oh yeah, no, yeah, no, that's that's correct. Miss Netherlands. Miss, Miss Netherlands, Netherlands beat out this it was on who she beat out. Like who she beat. So you're at a nightclub. You got two choices. You're 24 <laughs> oh. years old. You're single. How dark is it? Who Pat? are you picking? How right? dark is the club? But can you get the pictures of the two girls right next to each other? No, this, I don't know if the, you have the, that or the, not. This, By the way, I'm loving that I'm seeing this for the first time. I, I, live I haven't on, seen I'm it. Not seen I it. actually I'm put this, this on my Instagram. Okay, so then let me. Yeah, I have the contract. That's her. That's her smiling with getting the crown. That's the man, not. Her. That oh my bad. I apologize. That's the guy that just won Miss. Then he can't even tell, bro. Sorry, bro. I'm just out there. So, 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 Rob, why don't you just go to his Instagram? I'm gonna go pull it up because you have to see this. Okay. Yeah, it's on my Instagram. I did a, a picture by picture. That's the one you want to show. You want to show the one that's the picture by picture. Netherlands is woke, huh? Yeah. Netherlands went for it. Are you sure it's on your Instagram or it's on your Twitter? Scroll down. Uh, that, that, that see the beauty yeah, queen, and then I believe it's two pictures in a row. I could be wrong. Well, you got to okay, log let me in. See if you got it or not. Because you guys you open have to it. See if you this. open it in a new tab, it usually yeah. You're uh, here, Rob. I'll just text. And you, you never would have thought like Netherlands I have it going right here, for Rob. it, huh? I didn't. I didn't. They're part of the EU, bro. Just tell <laughs> me when you got it. I'm gonna text it. Do you see the picture? The guy on the left yep. wins. Try the next one. Try the next photo. There I you told go. You. Zoom in. What? Check this That's out. My oh my! The one God. to the left. Wins Neuro- the girl on the right is Neurotic the runner up. Who are the judges? That's the real question. So you're at a nightclub. Yeah. The two ones to your left, ones to your right, Vinny. How many drinks? One Pat? says to you. <laughs> How many one, drinks? Am one I in? says to you. Yeah. Hello, Vinny. <laughs> Hello, the other one says to you. Hi, Vinny. <laughs> Which one are you going to be picking? Do you realize the guy to the left wins Miss Netherlands? How many Long Island iced teas have I had? It doesn't matter how many wow. no, it's freaking ridiculous. virgin it's ridiculous. daiquiri, whatever you're going to have. <laughs> no, the girl on the right it's is unacceptable. It's unbelievable. Like, can it's we, unbelievable. Uh, can we punch in on the uh, number one? The girl on the right it's is beautiful. absolutely gorgeous. If you ever come to South Beach, Florida, we'd Please, love to host Adam, you Adam here. Adam Sosnick. Absolutely gorgeous. Punch it on the left because it's a sort of a different uh, perspective on the picture. Can you punch in, Rob? That's as far in as I okay. can go. That's intentional. Please they stay don't want that far away. Oh, all right, that's but, but, intentional. But, here's the, but, yeah, the, but the point is, close, if you guys. actually, while we're talking, try to find a picture that zoomed in a little bit more to see the, the actual. Just, when, just when, let's see the Adam's apple, when you're, buddy. When you're thinking about, the, when you're going through this, Rob, you find it. But here's what I want you to think about. You know how some ideas uh, create momentum and then it's short-lived and it disappears? Or some toys or some games or some whatever, right? This happens all the time. Hey, Remember in New York, they used to do the punch uh, uh, the person, and then you would run away. Oh, yeah, yeah, the knocking out Yeah, people. zoom in a little bit more. But, zoom but, in a little But what's the most? I'm sorry, can I interrupt you? Yeah, I'm go sorry. for it. Look at the women applauding. And uh, I have a whole theory on this uh, if I you want to get that? into it. Tell, tell us. Well, look, Andrew Tate talks about this frequently. By the way, your interview was great. I didn't watch all five hours, but you've done a great job, Patrick. Congratulations you. to you covering all that. Is that men are disagreeable by nature. Mm-hmm. We are the ones that say no. Women are agreeable by nature. They want to be liked. Yeah. That right there is a feminine culture gone awry. Agreeableness by all means. Agreeableness even to allow men to metaphorically rape our competitions. This is a metaphorical yeah. rape of Miss Netherlands is what it is. I am a man and I'm forcibly inserting myself without consent into your competition. I'm sorry to be so graphic, but that's what this is. And they're like, oh, yeah, progress. <laughs> Applauding. I, yep. I imagine the outrage. But, but imagine for a second if it was an all male competition. Yep, that's what I was just where I was going. put up with that crap. The guys in the back would be like, what the no, is we, going we, on? We would this step is up. Ridiculous. Like, who, do you, who are you, yes. you little punk? Yeah. Because this is why when a society goes too feminine, it can also become too tyrannical. But how long is yep. this going to last, though? So, so again, okay. go back to it. Listen, the question I'm asking is. Remember that one thing you stood on it and you, you would go, you would spin, whatever that thing was, that one uh, wheel thing. What was it? The, the stand the segue. segue. By the way, for po- about three years, yeah. five years, that thing was hot, right? Paul Blart, he, mall cop. That, we he can did talk it. about a lot of things, trendy products that disappeared after two, three, four, five years, yep. right?
right? Yeah. And you're no longer using it. Vaccines. How, how long, how long, how long is this going to go no. before they themselves, women, like, you know what it's going to take? It's going to take a feminist girl from the left who's a hardcore liberal to come out and say, guys, this is too much because let me tell you what happened to my daughter. I'm not with it. Yep. So I, um, it will only last as long as we allow it to last because it is a pathogen of evil, and we must be intolerant of this crap. There, there should be no openness to this, period. But I'm not as bullish on it ending soon because unlike the segue, this is supported by the CDC. This is supported by, and by the way, vastly billions of dollars to be made by Pfizer, AstraZeneca, Moderna, not just on the surgery, but on the annuities of other drugs that will be made. This is a cash cow for the most powerful companies in the world. You can look up the map, and there used to be two, two gender clinics 40 years ago in the Western world. Now there are well over five to 600 in America alone. You could fact check me on this, but I believe it's at least five or 600. Probably grew by five, just us sitting here. Yes. Mm -hmm. be, and by the way, if you, if you look at, yeah, the fall, in the 60s or 70s, there were some, and then there are none some. I, I don't know what the number is now. You could look it up. It's, I, yeah, it's going to be a lot. I, I, it's for, for, for at least five or 600 nationwide. So there's a whole cottage industry, Patrick. But here's the biggest problem, is the social contagion. It's like the lab leak from Wuhan, right? It's out, and so how do we actually inoculate ourselves against it? The, 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 the transmission is through TikTok, where they are preying on young girls that have puberty anxiety, that are misdiagnosing their puberty anxiety for gender dysphoria. And then they go into a predatory pediatri pediatric environment where the questions are all wrong. The questions are, well, do you think you're a man? Would you like to talk to somebody about whether you're a man? Instead of, I understand you're having anxiety about where you're at. Let's just take pause and allow yourself to develop. Puberty is actually the solution here. It's not the problem. What do they do? They give them puberty blockers. Mm -hmm. They slow down the thing that actually once it comes to completion and your hormones balance and you're like, okay, my estrogen and testosterone levels naturally kind of even out. Then we're, 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 we're clear. How long, Patrick? I have no idea. But we as clear courageous Americans need to stand up against this. And it is tyrannical in nature. That's got to be an outdated map. And I, there was one more recent. And Charlie, you, you, you said TikTok, and what a great uh, segue just of how China has just been owning our asses. They obviously own TikTok. They're infiltrating. They already, they've, they've already done it. Mm -hmm. They're training their kid. They train their kindergarten kids for, for, for combat. I'm not even joking. They, they put them in uh, war boot camps. They spy on China. China just, it's not a gun shooting war. It's a slowly infiltrating us and that would that's yeah. one of the main that's one of the main ones is the the trans and making men you also weak. said that you're not bullish on basically the stopping the, no. the, the biggest thing is i, mean, I am okay and, and i'll tell you guys here in a minute I, yeah well i, I, I want to hope so no, I, 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 i'll give you mine but i want you to yeah, go well i just want to i want to give you kudos yeah. because you just did a whole episode on this the dark history of the lgbt that's community the right that's the map i'm sorry just keep going all good but the key word in that is the t Guys, uh, you know, nobody's got a problem with the L's, the G's, the B's. The T is where, all right, what's happening right now? That's a totally different agenda. But by the way, you said that 20% of Gen, Gen Z, Z, that's what we're talking about here. Part the of future the of America Q. Yeah. is not part. It's Whereas, not going to work, guys. Well, it's not going to work. It's Let trending me, in the wrong by direction. By the way, we can, we can argue. This is why we have a debate. And, yeah. you know, we point out leaks in our argument, your argument, and we have we have a good time with this. So can you go, go to... Uh, Go to the other one I sent you. I just sent you two links in the email. If you can pull up one of them. One of them that validates his is the one from Pentagon. If you can pull that up. Uh, uh, I don't know if you have it or not. Okay. So the one from Pentagon shows this is from military.com. So this is not a website that is a second party, third party, a blogger, or any of that stuff. It's military.com. says here's how much the Pentagon has spent so far to, tr to treat transgender troops. The military, you and I are paying for this, okay? okay? Here's how much it's spent, okay? So, again, this is what website? Military.com. Don't be with the a Pentagon has with spent. A the Pentagon has spent $15 million in the past five years to treat 1,892 transgender troops, including $11.5 million for psychotherapy and $3.1 million for surgeries, according to Defense Department data provided to military.com. And then you can see up the 243 gender reassignment surgeries performed on the military personnel since 2016. 50 of them was in 16. 
193 occurred from January 1st, yep. 2018 to 2019. And then two years after President Donald Trump announced via Twitter, he would bar transgender individuals from serving the military. Okay, so now you see this, you're like, wait a minute, I paid this much? Yeah, you, taxpayer, you paid for it. Now, one argument I'll make to you how dumb this is, I want you to think about this. I want you to think you're the enemy. And the enemy, G. <laughs> Putin gets a report. Hey, uh, uh, sir, I have a report to show you deeply concerning. What's that? It's a massive threat. America has a new secret weapon on how they're going to take us down. What's that? Do they have a new Na SEAL nope. Team 6? Yep. No. No. Is it a new nuclear? No. They're investing in transgender surgeries. What? And these guys are a, like, they're even better than Navy SEALs. No way. <laughs> we think Putin's sitting there saying that's exactly what's going on with America. Now, <laughs> let me undercover. give the flip side. Now, watch this. Yeah. Who supported kids staying home and not going to school? Who supported it? Well, Who supported the it? Left the, the, left. the left. The left. The left. And General Surgeon Vivek comes out saying, no, we need to stay home and all this other stuff. Here's what we need to do because we can't risk the lives of all these elderly. Perfect. Give the other article that I just texted to you. This is new. By the way, look what website it is. Go to what website it is. It's important to show the website all the way at the top. This, this is the gov. U.S. Department of Health and Human Services. Not gov. This is who came to our office when COVID happened, if you remember. In Dallas. And in yeah. Dallas, they wanted to find us. They said, you guys covered all the things because Ian did a great job back then. So go back to the article on the bottom and see what happens. This is May 3rd. Put the date on when it is at the top so they can see it. May 3rd, 2023. New Surgeon General Advisory raises alarm about the devastating impact impact of the epidemic of loneliness and isolation in the United States. Hello? No shit, Sherlock. <laughs> you pulled this off, right? So here's the point. This is what's going to happen. Wait till one of their daughters gets violated by a transgender man, and it's deep in their house. And then they're going to realize, guys, I don't give a fly in. You know what? This just crossed the line. This is insanity. And then they're going to unify and come together and say, we have to create a league. Trans, you want to compete against each other? Go ahead and compete against each other. But the level, level of, like, you know, one of the questions I want to ask uh, 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 one of our friends that's coming on next Saturday, him and I have been exchanging. No one's going to believe that. This, guy's this Saturday. On the podcast. Next Saturday. Oh, next yeah. Saturday. Gotcha. I can't wait to have this conversation with him. It's a guy I actually really like, and it's a, probably one of the top five biggest liberal TV show hosts out there. I'm excited about having him on. Okay. so You're going to know his name. You, you, know, you know what the question is going to be? Here's what the question is going to be. The question is going to be, what do we have in common? What do, what do Republicans and OG Democrats, Kennedy Democrats, Clinton Democrats, now I'm not talking Biden Democrats, what do Clinton Democrats and JFK Democrats have in common with Republicans? What is it? What do we have? I, I bet there is so many things we agree on. Is it fair to say that you want to make sure your kids are protected? Yes, I do too. Great. Is it fair to say that you want to be able to Go to any church you want to go to. If you're an atheist, no problem. You're a Scientologist, no problem. You're a Christian, Muslim, go for it. Practice whatever you want. You agree that? I do too. Mm -hmm. Right. Is it fair to say that you don't want to pay so much taxes that the incentive goes away for your kids to want to go build a business one day, have their dreams become? Yeah, I'm with that. Okay. Is it fair that we won't want, want the country to be safe? I do. Maybe you don't want to spend as much money. Maybe I don't want to spend that much money. Maybe, we, But we both agree. Yes. How about the transgender stuff? Can I ask why? We can't agree on this. You know, I'm watching a video of Serena Williams. We've all seen it. She's on David Letterman. He's trying to get her to say, you know, she says, no, Andy Murray called me and said, let's play a match together. And Serena says, honestly, Andy, I don't want to play against you because it'll be a five-minute match. He'll beat me 6 nothing, 6 nothing. It won't even be close. I don't want to compete against men because I'll lose. I want to compete against women. It's not even fair. And then David Letterman and the audience is quiet because mm -hmm. you know what? She, and by the way, she's a liberal. Her husband, Armenian guy, he's a liberal. They're not Republicans, but she's saying logic. Eventually, this is the one, if you want to play this and look yeah. how uncomfortable it gets. Everyone's seen it here. Can, can you make it bigger and a plus? So watch what happens here with her. Well, actually, it's funny because Andy Murray, he oh, he was been joking about um, myself and him playing a match. And I'm like, Andy, seriously, like, are you kidding me? Because for me, tennis and men's tennis and women's tennis are completely almost two separate sports. She's a Democrat. So I'm like, if I were to play Andy Which Murray, I would sense. lose 6-0, 6-0 in 
five to six minutes, maybe ten minutes, because if, no, no, it's are, true. It's honestly, true. It's a completely really? no one's reacting. It's a completely different sport. The men are a lot faster, and me and um, they they get they serve harder, they hit harder. It's just a different game, mm -hmm. and I love to play women's tennis, and I oh, wow. I only want to play girls. Zero I don't applause. want to be embarrassed. Yes. I would not Zero. do the Zero tour. Applause. I wouldn't do Billie go. Jean any justice. So Andy, stop it. Yeah, we're not gonna. I'm not gonna let you kill me. I'm, okay, I'm with you when it comes. To oh, I'm with yeah. you. Oh, okay, David, oh, you sure been, you're with? This is old though. It has yeah, to. It, no, 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 it is. It's, it's ten years old. It's, That's not even today, a question. No, yeah, go ahead. It's not the point though. Yes, she would say the same thing today though. Hundred percent. She would say the same thing today because common sense and logic eventually prevails. Because eventually, certain communities, like one of the things you said, it's so powerful. The world, the word I've been uh, 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 dealing with lately for myself is tolerance and intolerance. You know, the whole thing about. You know, we, we Christian, you know, to me, three communities are ruining America. It's very easy for me. It's the scared and lazy Republicans, okay? Sure. You're not buying Time magazine. You're not buying, you know, any of this stuff that's available. You're not buying any of these media companies while they buy it. So number one is scared and lazy Republicans. Number two is tolerant Christians. Yes. And number three is do your thing libertarians. I think those three communities are ruining yeah. America. But logic and common sense comes out and Democrats say, she doesn't kind of make sense. I'm kind of on the same page with you there. So maybe it's America over my political party. Eventually, I think enough people are going to say America over my political party. Yeah, and I, I agree. So whether I'm bearish or the, the, the trans thing is unique because it's fundamentally predatory on anxiety that's not going to go away with young teenagers. And we have now trained hundreds of thousands of teachers to advance this social contagion, 40% of all brown kids, 38% of all students at Brown University identifies LGBTQIA+. Okay, 38%. This is the gayest generation in history. Let's just talk, you could have your own opinions on the gay thing, I believe in traditional marriage, obviously, but you're, how are you going to like repopulate the, the species if 40% of your people are, or 38% are gay? Yeah, 38% at Brown University Wow. are gay. 38%. This is a social contagion. So it is accelerating. It's not slowing down. But Patrick, you're right. It could end up slowing down, but it requires a mindset shift. It requires decent, ordinary people to say, okay, I grew up with the temperament of live and let live. I'm not going to allow you to have this trans zealotry continue mm -hmm. to spread across the country. This is a war on reality. What you just saw with Serena Williams and David Letterman was a 50-second refreshing clip of reality. The, the entire project of postmodernism rejects reality. It's you can be whatever you want to be as you want to be it. Take chemicals. Wage war on your own natural design. You get to decide your own existence. You can and just I, think it in your mind. You don't even have to take chemicals. No, that's just, exactly right. And I'm a billionaire, guys. I just, yeah, that's and, how I identify. So it, it really is this simple, and I, I don't mean to like trivialize this. The new divide in America is team reality against insane neurotic people. Yes, It's that simple. If you are on team reality, Bobby Kennedy, I think he's great. He lives on team reality, okay? Mm -hmm. He lived, he, uh, he, the, the biggest crime that Bobby Kennedy Jr. has committed is the crime of noticing. Oh, wait, why do so many people have autism? Why is our air like harder to breathe? Like why are testosterone rates down? Oh, he's a QAnon conspiracy theorist, far right wing extremist Kennedy Democrat because he commits the crime of noticing. Noticing is the first step to live in reality. Noticing when you don't, and saying something. Yes, about then it. speaking the truth, yes. which we believe in the Christian tradition is the logos, right? So it's very simple. The West used to, 99% of people in the West used to believe in this, regardless of your religious affiliation. I'm going to notice what's happening around me. I'm going to say what's happening around me. And then we can have a discussion of whether or not that should continue. Now you're not even allowed to notice it. Now it's you're a bigot, you're a terrible person for even mentioning the injustice that is so obviously happening around you. Yeah, absolute truth. And so, the by, the, by the way, have you seen the Gallup poll? Have you seen the Gallup poll that shows in America? I don't know if I'm asking Brandon to say this because this video that we did on LGBTQ, if you've not seen this video, well, let me tell you. It's great. It, it, the amount of uh, emails and stuff I got from positive people. Positive or negative? 95% was positive. Good. Good. Saying I didn't even know this data. You know what was mm -hmm. one of the most interesting uh, data uh, data points? Uh, Brand, if you can send it to me. If you don't, it's all good. You have it in your notes. It went not this one. It's another one. He didn't send you the right one. This this one everyone's seen. There was one that we had that showed in 1979. They asked. It's a Gallup poll. Mm -hmm. They asked Americans what percentage of gays are they gay because they're born that way versus their environment. 
You know what percentage of Americans in 1979 said you're born gay versus environment? Less than 15% probably. Exactly wow. 13%. Interesting. You're right there, wow. right? You know what the number is today here? I got it's the Gallup poll. I want to show you. Probably 65%. It, 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 I, I, I want to say it's 49%. Oh, wow. oh, wow. I, I want to say. That's lower than I thought. Yeah, you have to see this Gallup poll. By the way, this link to this Gallup poll, I, two things. I recommend go watch that LGBTQ video. And two, keep this Gallup poll we're about to put. Put it in the comment section so people can also have it, Rob. I'm texting it to you if you can pull it up because it's different versus when somebody says it versus you see it, Gallup.com, that says what this is. And the, the one I want you to go to where it says, I'm going to listen regardless. Okay, go all the way to the bottom that says, what percentage of people were born gay versus their environment? Okay, it's all the way, I think, at the bottom, if you can find this. Yeah. By the way, Gallup, pretty credible very, uh, very polling. Credible. Very credible. Source, yeah. yeah. So and, not far and right, not far left. They've Just also shown that math. the country's moving center right. That's another poll they've done recently, which is really interesting. By the way, he's right. And you know what else they found out, which was kind of weird? This whole thing about born gay versus not born gay. There was another thing that they said about where we were at back in the days on allowing gays to adopt children. This one produced the biggest controversy on yeah. the questions. Back in 1977, it was only 14%. They said they should. Today, it's 75%. If you go all the way to the bottom and type in adopt, if you just control F adopt, it'll show up. If you just want to type in, there you go. Look at that. 1977, 14% said they should. 77% no, they should not. But in 2019, it's 75% they should. It's now, inverted. It's inverted, okay? And then you have the other 13% that said they were born or they were not born. The whole point is, and then there was another data that came out with Gallup, which was very interesting, the whole about black liberals versus white liberals. Yep. I don't know if you've seen this one. No, but I, I, b black liberals tend to be more socially conservative than white liberals. By, by a mile. Even white conservatives, they're more socially conservative then. Black, so, so Republicans, black liberals, white liberals. Just mm -hmm. think about those three, okay? Same question. What percentage of gays are born gay? Versus, you know, their environment. Okay, yeah. Republicans, Nature versus nurture. Republicans say no. It's your environment. You're not born gay. Okay. White liberals, seventy-two yeah. percent said you're born that way. You know what black liberals was? Thirty percent. I believe it. They were twenty-one percent away from Republicans and forty-two percent away from white liberals. So I think there's and and, and then by the way, when you look at the Muslim community. And you know what percentage of Muslims vote uh, liberal? Do you know what percentage Probably of Muslims 80%. vote? 80%. 70-plus percent vote what? liberal. But by, by the way, here's the data for you. Very interesting. This is something for you to be considering within Turning Point USA to think about. Check this out. Midterms. Do you know from 2018 midterms to 2022 midterms? Watch this. 2018 midterms to 2022 midterms, specifically Muslims. Okay. 2018 midterms, only 17% voted Republican. Let me say it again. 2018 midterms, only 17% voted Republican. Do you know what it was in 2022? 28%. Oh, wow. Guys, that's 11% 11 in that, four years. That, Here's what is happening. That's, that, per, that's profound. That's profound. Here's what's happening. By the way, we'll send you that data. Here's what's happening, which is exciting. This is what I love that's happened that's exciting, which is kind of awkward. It's very awkward, very weird, but it's exciting. Mm -hmm. Okay. What would happen to liberals? You ready for this one? Mm -hmm. By the way, we know why Muslims don't vote conservative, because conservatives are pro-Israel, so that's kind of, of like something that stems with them, so they kind of like... But in every issue, abortion, Muslims have the lowest percentage of divorces, lowest percentage of divorces, how they feel about abortion, how they feel about LGBTQ, all of that stuff, Muslims have a conservative belief. But Democrats have won over the Muslim vote as well as the black vote because of, you know, certain positions, right? What if conservatives are able to win black liberals and what if conservatives are able to win muslims and what if muslims and christians come together and say look let's set aside prophet muhammad and jesus mm -hmm. we know what you believe in we know what we believe in but listen when it comes onto these issues with family let's unite do you know how scary it would be if a republican strategist behind closed doors brought the 10 biggest influencers and said we have to make a better argument to muslims because republicans have always been what no, 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 stiff arm to Muslims. No, 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 stiff arm to Muslims. There's a lot of Muslims that are waiting to convert to Republican. Republicans are not doing a good job winning them over. The argument makes sense for Muslims to be Republican, but Republicans are doing a terrible job winning their vote. So all I'm saying to you is when we're talking about, you know, this thing's going to get worse, this thing's going to get worse, I think you have to present your argument better yeah. to convert, and if we do, I think well, common sense is going to eventually prevail. Yeah, and I...
I'm obviously not a Muslim, <laughs> but um, I will say this. I would much rather work with a Muslim parent association than an LGBTQ organization on the right. And the opposite is actually happening. People on the right are trying to go out of their way to go try to make peace with the gay mafia. And I think the opposite. It's like, well, no, go to people that actually share some of your values, theological differences aside. You saw in Dearborn, Michigan, the parents that were rising up against the grooming sexual per perversion of children were Muslim families. Mm -hmm. And you see this with Latinos. You see this, again, with blacks and Muslims. So here... Here's what you're getting at, Patrick, which is very deep, and I agree completely, which is that this woke virus, as we call it, right, these woke idea pathogens, they are, they are only popular in white, upper-middle-class, college-educated, coastal communities, and yet they are being almost colonistically imposed on the rest of the country. So Midwestern Christians don't want the woke thing. But what, what there is a thermonuclear political weapon that's about to be deployed where you can exploit how white liberal ideas are being forced to black youth, Hispanic youth, and Muslim youth. That has not been exploited. And we're seeing it in the polling. We're seeing it where the Yale, Harvard, white Upper East Side liberals in New York who all agree that the trans thing is the greatest thing ever, they all want this... But you know where it's unpopular? People that still have an attachment to the customs and the traditions of their home country that have not yet been infected by the Yale zeitgeist of the chemical castration of children. And by, by the way, guys, let me tell you, I'm telling you right now, this is going to sound weird. If Republicans win the Muslim vote and the black liberal vote, it's game over for a few decades, and it's not possible, it's not impossible to do so. The presentation has to be better by purely presenting logic. Go back to the well, Gallup data, and then I yeah. want to hear your thoughts. Go back on the Gallup data. Control F for me, because you, we didn't show it, so I want the audience to see exactly. Control F, the word born. Okay, you found it. Is this it? Okay, is this? Yeah, that's it. Yeah. So watch this. In your view of being gay or lesbian, something you're born with, or due to factors as upbringing and environment. Look at this. Nine, this is 2019 is as far as it goes. What does it say? Born with 49%. Go all the way to the bottom. That says uh, in 1977, 13%. Okay. It, how did this happen? This is the constant trying to baptize people to think this is normal and they're able to go to the youngest generation. There's two data points with traditionalists. There's one that says 1.7% of them are gay. There's another one that says 0.8% of them are gay. If there's one thing we know about traditionalists, they could give a shit about our opinion. So they're not going to be like not coming out of closet because they're worried about what you and I think about it. They're going to do whatever the hell they want to do. And then with, with these two guys, two communities, imagine all of a sudden a liberal has to defend a Muslim with pure values. No, this, and, but you see, you see Elon Omar tap dance around this whenever she gets asked questions about this trans stuff or Rashida Tlaib, who are the two most outspoken Muslim members of Congress. Interestingly enough, there was a Muslim attorney general candidate who lost by 240 votes in Arizona, my home state, Abe Hamaday, who should have been attorney general. Uh, and there is a sizable Muslim population in Arizona, and he was really clear on all the major issues. And so just to kind of reemphasize the point here, here's understandably, and Pat, you'll have to meet kind of the right halfway. There's an understandable fear that that American Muslims have animosity towards American Christians and vice versa. OK, there is some truth to that in the very radical Islamic sure, circles. OK, sure. however, we're talking about politics which by definition is the sport of addition and multiplication, not division and subtraction. So if you want to multiply your ranks, you have a community of people that you don't agree with theologically sure. that are currently a devoted Democrat voting group. Wouldn't it make sense to then just focus on two issues that pro-life trans, pro-life trans, pro-life trans. Muslims are 99% in agreement. Why, why? So so say, why is there that well, I, division between the two? So what, Some what? of it is is a... Is a Unders is a theological, and I share some of this, right, belief that radical Muslims want to bring Sharia to the United States. Okay. That, and I'm not saying I even believe that, you know, wholeheartedly. That That is something a lot of Christians do believe. Secondly, post 9-11, there was a fair amount of nonprofit chatter and a fair amount of activism that presented Islam 
with no nuance. No nuance in the sense of that all Muslims believe the same thing. And that's, I don't think, a fair representation, right? There's radical Muslims. There's people that take it, you know, I have a very good friend, Zudi Jasser in Arizona, who is calling for a reformation, right? But here's the point, is that what I would challenge Republicans or conservatives with is like, okay, let's pretend you think that Muslims want an authoritarian regime. You're already living under one. Hmm. You're living under a trans-authoritarian regime. And here's a group of people that want to smash that regime. Wouldn't it be nice to build a coalition for once? So, so let me tell you. So, so I'm, I'm, I'm about to get a little uncomfortable with the audience, and they may or may not like it, but that's my comfort zone, okay? Mm-hmm. So we're in the Bahamas last week. We're having dinner. We're laughing our asses off mm-hmm. for about three hours. Guy sitting across from me is the same guy that I went to him to ask for the Quran that I gifted to Tate at the end. If you watch the interview with Tate at the end, I didn't, I gave get, him I didn't, a, I didn't get that far. Yeah, yeah. But, but if you just go to the last okay. two minutes, that's all you need to do. I gave him a Quran. I gave him a Bible from 1870, wow. and I gave him Mere Christianity by, by C.S. C.S. Lewis. My favorite read. book. I'm like, listen, here's three books. One of them is an old Bible. One of them is C.S. Lewis. Hopefully you read C.S. Lewis. You know, do your thing. He loved them, by the way. Yeah, by the way, he he was emo- if you see it, the guy doesn't get emotional. You could tell he got yeah, emotional when this gift was given it. to him. And obviously we... Uh, uh, we we have. Talk, I love the fact that Tucker did the interview with them, and he went to Romania. And whether we were the guinea pigs to realize that you can make it back to America to Tucker, <laughs> yeah. it is all good. You yeah. know, we're glad we did that. Different but this is not Rob. the one. Don't worry about it, Rob. It's, it's fine. It's it's a newer one. That's the older one. But here's 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 what happened there. When we talked to this guy, Haas Stud, love him, Amazing. love his wife Naveen, good people. So he starts talking about Muslims, America, Israel, Republican, Christians. And this guy is a hardcore conservative. Yeah. Maybe more a hardcore conservative than a Muslim. And that's saying something because he is a Muslim and a proud one. And he's the kind that converts. He's not a kind that just talks about it. So he's the kind that converts. And he converts Christians. And we, I think the number was shown on how many uh, Americans have converted to Muslim. The number is like 20,000 Christians, of which 75% are women. That have. 25% are men. Okay. And a lot of them are blacks, by the way, that, that are converting. And that's been the case since the 60s. That's been the case since the 60s. Shorabs, Avi, Ali, we, we Tyson, all this. Yeah. We did. Yeah. But, but he, here's, here's where it went. I said, and he said, well, you know, the, the challenges that Muslims, you know, they're being identified stereotypes with, uh, you know, being uh, 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 terrorists and violent. Okay. No problem. I said, let me ask you a question. I said, are all stereotypes correct or incorrect? Are they partially correct? He says, well, Pat. I said, let me just kind of give you some stuff here. So you ready? He says, yes. I said, the Armenian. I said, I'm Armenian. I'm half Armenian, half Assyrian. I said, do you realize AIG flew out to my house to drop my contract because I was Armenian because the guy talked to my wife and said, Armenians are known for insurance fraud. Hmm. And we're worried that, Patrick, the same thing's going to happen. It's unbelievable. The same guy that came with the lawyer to terminate me, seven years later at his retirement on a yacht, he had five speakers to speak in front of his entire friends and family. The last one that spoke was his best friend. The second to the last one was me. Wow. That spoke at we are great friends today. Mutual respect you like you would have been. I love this guy. I can say that, right? I said, okay, what are um, Asians known for? And we're in the room, we're just asking everybody, because there's a Filipino. It's, oh, well, you know, driving. Okay. Jews. Okay, well, it's stereotype. You really want to say this? Cheap money. Okay. Hey, blacks, you know, black on black crime, you know, fatherless homes. Okay. You know, we kept going. Everything. Indian, 7-Eleven, uh, you know, <laughs> gas stations. Literally everybody. And it was all nationalities. So it was comfortable to say it because you're making fun of yourself. You're being self-deprecating. I said, when's the last time you heard about a black terrorist? He says, what do you mean? I said, have you ever heard about the stereotype, a black terrorist? No. He's like, No. I said, why is there, you know, Middle East Muslim terrorists? Why is that connotation there? So, well, you know, it's because there's so much anger of what the West has done to this, to this. Okay, you go look at the top 10 countries in the world for the last 50 years. This data is out there. If you look at the top 10 countries in the world who has the most, you know, terrorist attacks, violent attacks against each other, eight out of 10 is Muslim. Of course. So now they're going to sit there and say, see, I knew you were against me. I knew you were against this. No problem. Hear me out. Now, let's flip it on them. You ready for the other side, that Muslims are going to like this part? I was born in Iran. Ten years I lived in Iran. You know what the West did to Middle Eastern countries before the Ottoman Empire fell in whatever, 1916, 1917, 1918, when the Ottoman Empire fell? And all of these countries were part of theirs, and then all of a sudden, hey, 
you know, we're going to regulate these guys, Palestine and this, and we're going to, France and Britain, they're going to have these countries that are going to, you know, regulate. Hey, uh, Iran, you guys don't know how to manage oil. We'll take care of your oil. Look, these people are dumb. Let's just take care of their money, their, their oil, right? The, the British oil company. Yeah, so yeah. guess what? These guys are saying, no, 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 no. Listen, stop trying to take our money. You keep ruining our country by creating so many proxy wars and havoc. Muslims have a good point there. And then there's a statistic that came out showing the, uh, the angriest people in the world. Do you know the angriest people in the world? You can pull up the statistic, Rob, while we're talking. Do you know the angriest people in the world? Eight out of ten are Muslim countries. Yeah. Why, though? Because you're raised. I'm in Iran. Trust me, my friends and family, if you come to one of our parties, we look like we're angry half the time. We're just having a conversation. <laughs> well, For no but, reason. But I'll say ten more seconds, <laughs> yeah. and I'll give it over to you. And I want to hear your thoughts on this. The point I'm trying to make right there, look at this. Angriest countries. and Go to the top so people can see world's angriest countries. I, I think there's a simple explanation for that. By the way, if you look at this one, the third Ar one Armenia's makes a lot of Christian. sense. Armenia. Yeah. The third one makes a lot Armenia. of sense. Armenians, Azerbaijan, Turkey, yeah. the whole, you know, look who's above Armenia, yeah. by the way. Who's uh, angry at who? Armenia, Turkey. Turkey. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But, but this, this is the point I'm making to you. I think if the way it's presented in the following way. Listen, Muslims, Islam. Listen, man, stop like acting like you guys are saints and innocent and your history is beautiful and perfect. Relax, bro. You know you got some dirt in your history. Fair. But, but no, no, you're right. Christians, West, relax. Like, hey, we got 800 military bases in the world. We're in everyone's freaking business. Of course you're going to piss people off. You want to know about everyone's business, everyone's divorce? Leave my marriage alone. Of course you're going to create enemies. Okay. Now we have a mutual understanding and agreement. What do we agree on? Family values and principles. Why don't we unite here and all the other stuff? Guess what, Muslims? Do you know in every region in the world what religion has the most babies per women? Probably Islam. In every region in the world, except for one, South and Central America, every other region, number one is Muslims. Guess what, Christians? You ain't having enough babies. That's your problem. Mm -hmm. Go compete. Have more babies. These guys are doing 2.9, 4.9. You're doing 1.9, 2.1. Of course you're going to get your ass handed to you. Stop being so upset and go in the bedroom and make some damn babies. Mm -hmm. You're making enough of them. These are logical conversations where you can't be like, well, I don't want to compete against Muslims. No, they're kicking your ass. This is a real conversation that what are you doing about it? So, again, that's my point on what I think we can do to kind of get the two to see a little bit more on what we're seeing and what weaknesses some Christians have on this as well. Your thoughts? Yeah, I don't want to go too deep theologically. I think there's a super simple reason why most Muslim countries have difficult or rather so angry is because they don't embrace a simple market principle of charging interest is that if you do not have interest you cannot freely be, lend out money now there's some workarounds around that but you're, you're going to remain permanently poor if you do not have a, a banking system that allows for entrepreneurial activity I would imagine that all of us have taken out loans before. Usury is what you're yes, referring no, to, it, right? It's in, in this, in Which this, was used to be outlawed in the Christian community. Yes. That, How Jews that, that's made correct. all the money. Yes, and uh, Jews find a workaround in the book of Exodus. It explicitly actually it prohibits it, uh, but the rabbis found a workaround because they realized that flourishing and prosperity actually yes. comes with the ability to charge interest, right? I'm very pro-interest because then you're allowed to bet on entrepreneurs and bet on people to buy homes. So I, I think that that's part of it, but not not the whole story. I, I don't know how deep you want to get into this theologically, Patrick. There are some fundamental differences between worldview of Muslims and Christians that I think need to be ironed out, but I will get back to... I, I'm not that interested in that conversation. I'm just not. What I'm more interested in is understanding that that right now we are not living in a secular America we're living in a place where the God of America has replaced it with trans zealotry, worship of the self, widespread narcissism, and kind of a globalist ideal. Yeah. And so the question is, how do you then defeat that thing? And sometimes you have to make a prudent step that you might not be thrilled with to partner with a group of people that you do not see eye to eye on, theologically or otherwise, to build a coalition to win. Whether it be in World War II or other times, we as the United States have been willing to sometimes build coalitions yeah. with governments, people. And so, again, I'm if, 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 if a Muslim you know, imam was here, we'd have a lot of disagreements, right? Four major differences between Islam and Christianity off the top of my head. You know, I believe in the inerrancy of the, the Bible. They believe in the Quran. They believe in the prophet Muhammad. One of the reasons they, they tend to be a violent people, too, is because their prophet was a very violent person. Christ was not, right? Um, not, not to mention the Trinity. They believe in Allah. There's a lot of differences, right? However, the things we can agree on in American public policy is this: is as simple as this. Let's just start here. It is impossible to be a devout Muslim and vote Democrat. 
It's impossible. How you as a Muslim could then say you believe in what the Quran teaches and what Allah commands of you, right? And also say it's okay to teach this grooming perversion. I, I, Elon Omar and Rashida Tlaib are sitting on some very, very fragile footing right there. And they're, only, they're, they're able to capture those Democrat votes over fear-mongering of deportation or immigration or whatever their thing is. That's one element of it. More importantly, though, the most socially conservative people in America are Muslims. And I, I, I agree with you, Pat. It potentially could be some political upside for Republicans, but it's not going to be easy. What you just summarized, both sides giving a little bit. I know the conservative base well. There is there is a lot of skepticism oh towards. God. It makes no sense. To I, me, I'm not bro. saying it makes rational. I'm I saying I'm that. just I'm telling you the truth of and what the base is saying okay. when it comes to Islam. Let me push the base back. Let me push the base back. Let me push the no, base please. back and push back with me as well because I'm trying to reason here because uh, 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 slowly to me on the Republican Party I'm like these guys are only wanting to talk to people that agree with them. And it's like listen. Stop being such a pansy and start kind of like figuring out other people and how we can create areas that we can reach. I mean, let me make my point and, and then no, you, no, you can no, say. Yeah. So, for example, for me here. All right. So what's more important to you, being right theologically or you having the other side gaining the freedom to teach your kids about trans and all this other stuff? What's more important to me? We can have a conversation for debate and it's purely theological. Totally fine. We can have that debate, and Christians are going to say, well, you know what? Yeah, I agree with this guy. Oh, no, no, I agree with that guy. Muslims are going to say, you have no clue what you're talking about. Fine. There's a time and place for that. We're not talking about that. We're talking about an area where the opposing party is doing evil things, and it's making evil behavior seem normal, and I'm not for it. And if I can, in a way, if, if gangs used to do this in L.A., and you have you know, TVR or MS-13, Mara Savatrucha, or you have Blood, Crip, you have Tuna, you know, you have Black Diamonds, you, all these things that you can go with, with different gangs that they had in L.A., okay? Even Armenian power. Like, listen, bro, we're Armenian. Filipinos had a strong gang, all these guys. But when it comes into this area, we have to protect gang this. I'm doing an event in Glendale. Yeah. No hotel wants to give us their location. Alex Theater, who's owned by the city, has 1,700 people. I went to Glendale High School. They said, we know PPD. We follow his content. The city is not allowing Patrick to do his event for parents at Alex Theater. I can't do an event at Alex Theater. Now we're talking a couple different hotels. Every Armenian hall in Glendale and surrounding areas has said, you have our place for free. Come and do your event there for parents. Every one of them. We just had a Zoom. Okay, we're trying to find a location here. But for me... To sit there and say, yeah, you know, uh, and, and by the way, while I'm saying this to you, you know who's the first person that reached out? Lexit. You know who reached out? Former gangsters from MS-13 that are not Christians, devout, saying, hey, we'll come and protect, making sure Antifa's not going to do anything. No one's going to mess with us. Trust me. We're going to show up. Fine. I think we have to kind of figure out a way to look at, uh, 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 again, we haven't seen in a long time, Charlie, uh, uh, for a uh, uh, society like ours, you know, it starts off with the founder. Who are the founders? Benjamin Rush, you know, Washington, all these guys who they really did the hard job. We're doing the easy job. We ain't doing shit. They had it hard, right? These 56 guys. And then mm -hmm. the founders after those guys shows up barbarians. I'm going to go build a railroad. What are you going to do? Bro, dude, that's what are you talking about? Let me do it. I'm going to do it. Carnegie, Chase, boom. Damn, these guys actually pulled it off. Yes, Flagler. That's some crazy shit. Industrial. Okay, so those are the barbarians. And they're willing to fight the fight. And then you got... You know, the builders and the explorer. What if we can do this? And let's go explore this. And let's go explore that. And then comes the administrator. Well, we need some laws. And we need to create some rules and regulations. Fine. We need law and order. Then shows up the bureaucrats and the aristocrats, which is the shit we're in right now. You know who's a guy that can save that society and the civilization? The synergist. Who's a synergist today in America? I actually want to know. Who is a synergist? Everybody is in their own safe tribe sitting around talking to people that agree with them. Who is saying, guys, can we do this? You got some shit. I got some shit. You got some shit. Let's just freaking talk. Because we keep acting like everybody's perfect. We can't unify the group. What if we pull that off? So I think if we were to behind closers, I totally understand what you're saying because I think your you're following is more Christian, devout, yes. Jesus, God-loving, all of that stuff. And maybe it's a tough message for you to give. Maybe it's a message that a person that's a like an RFK type of a Muslim that can give out a turning point USA next year to yes. follow and you're to kind of give. Maybe it doesn't come from you. And let the audience say, well, you have no clue what you're I, talking about. I, I, two things. I think that 
there needs to be a reformation in Islam. I, I will stand by that. But my politics right now are about, people say, Charlie, what motivates you? I want to win. I want to win. I want to defeat this woke, authoritarian machine that is taking over everything. Everything. You do that by addition. And so if there is a group of people that are growing, having lots of kids, and they're being affected by it, then yes. But, I mean, Patrick, you know this. In Christianity, there is a belief that is not going to go away that, you know, the 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 people of Ishmael, right, in Genesis 16, I believe, it's just it it's predicted to be that of toil and disagreement and division, and some people have even stronger views on Islam than on that. That is an important theological discussion. Happy to have that with other people. But we're talking about politics. And you can't ever do that if you're not in power. <laughs> and you're going to remain in the minority if you do not capitalize. So I, I'm in full harmony with you, Patrick. So yeah. both can be simultaneously true. Can I make one up? I, I, wouldn't, I wouldn't demand a Muslim to like adopt every one of my views if you know I, they don't have to that's not the point right but they don't but you don't have to and they don't have to neither one of us have to no but, but i i just also want to be i, I to I, win I, I hope i'm introducing just a little bit of difficulty of uh, this is going to be challenging oh brother i i i don't specialize in the uh, easy i specialize no, in the I, difficulty I, I know that. and the yes. and so do you by the yes. way just, yes. by the way just so everybody knows you cannot you can talk to kayla and what i said to him behind closed doors okay I get a call from another organization where you do podcasts for them, and I said, you know what? I would love for uh, Charlie to be here with my team. I'd love to have you here to create content. I'd love to sign you. I'm a big fan of you, and I know you make a lot of money where you know you, you don't need to go to anybody. You, you're doing very well for yourself. You're crushing it. I think uh, uh, if this bullshit 30 under 30 stuff didn't have anything to do with politics, you would need to be in the top 10 list, if not top five. I think that's how powerful and influential you are. I think that's how important you are. I think you're an incredible communicator. I think you can reason. I think you're smart. I think you're eloquent. I think you're tough. I think even when assholes are being jerks to you, you're still gentle with them, respectful with them. You let them keep the dignity. That is not an easy thing to do as a guy. How old are you right now, buddy? It, it, you know how hard it is to, to do that at 29. 29. You may not know because to you it's like normal. I've been 29 before, and I've been around a lot of killer 20-year-olds who are competitive. It's not easy to, to, to do, do. So I think you are a very, very important figure in politics, and you will be forever. Even last time I talked to you about, you know, one day running president and all this stuff, you're like, it's not what I'm going to do. I'm going to be doing kingmaking and all this stuff. But I, I was so impressed by you, by the way you defended DeSantis last time. It was so impressive for me. And I got to tell you, like, I'm like, you know what, freaking, what a mensch this guy is. What a freaking good guy that can be a guy that can actually unify this group. You're not kind of a guy. Every one of my leaders has had you at their events. I don't know who's had you. They're, they're always, yeah, they're, and now you're going to be at the MGM Grand 10, 10,000 plus people. They can't great. wait to see you with, you know, Khabib and all these other guys. But I think the next phase, Charlie, the role we're going to play, we're going to play a different role. I'm not born here, so I have no interest in being a governor. We're going to play a different role by being, building one of the biggest media companies in the world, and we'll compete. And you're on your way. And, and we'll have the conversations with everybody, those who hate us, those who love us, those who are indifferent, those who don't know us. We want to talk to everybody. You guys are making a big difference. But, but I think if there is a guy that can play a role of a synergist with the way he's wired, I think you're one of those guys. Thank you. I just want you to consider and, and, that when you're thinking and, and, about this and, leaving here today. And we try to do that at Turning Point. I'm sorry. To, you, no, I, and I, I mean, fully agree. I looked at your date of birth. You're going to be 30 October 14th, 1993. Yeah. Ridiculous. The yeah. fact that you're that you're is only it great? By the way, guess what? Guess what sign he is? I know it's, you know, you're not October? a you're, you're, you're a Libra. Libra's balanced. They're able to have those types of. He's the right wiring to be able to be one of the synergists the next 20 years. I I am so looking forward to your evolution. I'm 44. And for the people that knew me at 29 and, and they tell stories, people don't believe who I was at 29 and who I was at 22 or even 18. This is why I love the fact that my sister uh, is one of the vice presidents in the company doing a great job, Paulette and CMX Sabatimani, and, you know, uh, uh, the family, everything that we because you get to ask those questions. But I think you can play a very mm -hmm. big role of a synergist, and God knows America needs it right now. Well, in, in the spirit of being a synergist, um, you're going to have a tough job. We all are. Yeah. And I'll tell you why. Everything you were just talking about with Islam and Christianity and having the, you know, the conservative, or you, what is even a conservative or a liberal these days? You know, that's why, uh, where am I going with this? This comes down to color. And not the color of your skin. The color of the jersey that you wear. I say this all the time. I'm not team red. I'm not team blue. I'm on team red, white, and blue. And just think about how hard it is when you're on a team to wear another team's jersey. Just think about that for a second. I'm a huge Miami Heat fan. 
There's no chance I'm wearing a Knicks jersey. This guy's a Lakers fan. There's no chance he's wearing a Celtics jersey. All right. If you're a, a Cowboys fan, you're not going to switch over to a Giants jersey. If you're a, a Yankees fan, Ball or fan, maybe even a Yankees owner it. at this point, it. you're not wearing a Bosox jersey. Yeah. So that is what you're asking people to do in the Islam community, in the Christian community, yeah. in the Jewish community. You're asking me, like, liberal conservative to me, I don't even know that. I know people who are quote unquote conservative. They are the, some of those liberal, sloppy people I know. Uh, and vice versa. You're asking people to swap jerseys. No, we're not. No, no, no. That, that's what... Uh, yes, in order to to switch votes, if someone is wearing a team red jersey, yeah, like that's what they wear, and you want them to wear a blue jersey, it's a very challenging <laughs> Dude, I, job. I, I am so about to hire five BIs, business analysts, business in, in, you know intelligence, come in here pull up the top 20 values of a Muslim, of how they raise their family, what they look at, and put it together with percentage of that being Democrat or being Republican or independent. And that argument can be made for Muslims to realize, aside from your religion, okay, aside from your religion, you lean more towards a conservative Republican than a liberal Democrat. Mm. That BI needs to be explained to the thinkers then it needs to be presented to the day-to-day -day person. And to me, the reason why I said I don't think it's switching jerseys, mm -hmm. I don't think you're switching jerseys. I think you're wearing the jersey of a value that you don't stand for today. This is not John F. Kennedy Democrat. It ain't even Bill Clinton Democrat today. That's, it's that's just right. not. That's right. You're, you're, the Bill Clinton Democrat, dude, I love those guys. Let's talk. And by the way, again, don't, I didn't say Monica Lewinsky. I'm talking about Bill Clinton <laughs> policy Democrats or John F. Kennedy Democrats. Yes. Today... This doesn't make any sense, and I think it's going to get exposed uh, very quickly. i got two other things to do topic-wise, and then we'll wrap up and Great. finish it off. So Biden life expectancy and its implications, <laughs> okay? Because actually, I'm actually really curious, you know, do you think it's, he's going to be the guy that's going to be running? Or now let me just read the story, and I'll go sure. to you. So President Joe Biden's life expectancy is a topic of concern as voters uh, consider his potential second term. At 80 years old, Biden's uh, statistical possibilities of living to finish his term is uncertain, as you'd expect the, rise, uh, the risk of dying increases as we age, says uh, Katia uh, Irvesi of a nerd wallet. According to Lervasi, an 80 year old male Biden has a 33%, 31% chance of dying in the next 33% chance, 31% <laughs> chance of dying in the next five years, and a 64.27% chance of dying within the next 10 years. However, Biden's health challenges and the stress of being president raises questions about his ability to compete, complete a second term. If Biden were to win a re election, but not complete his term, Vice President Kamala Harris will become the first female president. So is age an issue with you right now? And do you think Dems are starting to realize it? Uh, age with Joe Biden? Yes. Or Yeah, I mean, uh, yes, but I, I have a contrarian view here where I don't think candidates really matter nearly as much as they used to, as long as the Democrats are the only ones that are investing in meaningful election infrastructure. This is something we're talking a lot about at Turning Point Action at our big action conference. By the way, if you're in if you're in Florida, come this weekend, tpaction.com. Just had to plug that. Uh, <laughs> and by the way, Value Tim's going to have a booth there. Just yeah, gonna, you're going to see there. Vinny there. Be there. Yeah, oh, yeah, a bunch sure, of guys brother. are going to be there. It's going to be You'll, great. Yeah. So tpaction.com. But what is election infrastructure? It's data, voter registration, election integrity, early voting, ballot chasing. I say this kiddingly, but not really. They could run Jimmy Carter from hospice and win because they can micro-target their voters, run a bunch of ads. What a point. And John Fetterman is, is an evidence of this. So I'm not as interested in the horse race of the who. I'm interested in the how. And the how is the boring but necessary clipboard and tennis shoes type of grassroots work that, quite honestly, we used to make fun of Barack Obama for. We call them a Chicago community political organizer, but that's what they've now built. And so for just one example, the game has totally changed because of COVID and our reaction to COVID with mass mail-in balloting. Georgia used to, had two, used to have 240, uh, 247,000 mail-in ballots in 2018. You can look up the number. I believe Georgia had about like 2.4 million people vote by mail in the midterms in 2022. That's a tenfold increase. Um, and... So, but that the whole game has changed then. So it, it went from a Democrat plus eight state, uh, a Republican plus eight state, to now a Democrat plus one state. Um, yeah, you could look at the, the actual final numbers there. So I don't know, like the, the Joe Biden thing, he can't make coherent sentences, can't do all that. I don't know. I don't know how much it matters. I think right now, until we as Republicans achieve parity with the Democrats with the boring stuff of elections, candidates are not going to matter for quite some time. Got it. Uh, I think you had something to say about yeah, this well, within the, your space. The whole question was podcast. Biden's life expectancy, right? 
This is actually something I know a lot about. This is actually my business. I deal in life insurance and life insurance settlement. Did you take all- out a policy on him? It's probably, he's probably too old to take out a policy, yeah, but he go. probably has a policy. But yes, I'm very familiar with how life insurance works and how life policies work because I buy them off of old people. Understand what I just said. I buy life insurance policies off of old people and I give them money. So it is my job to actually understand their life expectancy. Their comorbidities. Literally. It's, yeah. called, it's called the mortality yeah. tables. And here's how this works. So I actually did the life expectancy of a couple different scenarios for Biden's health. I ran it at standard health, I ran it at substandard health, and I ran it at uninsurable health, right? If Biden is considered standard health, right, he'd have a 128-month life expectancy, okay? Standard health, that's 10 years. Substandard, table two, table four, right? You're talking 93 to 100 months, okay? If he's completely uninsurable for his age, 500% rating, he'd have a 60-month life expectancy. That's five years, so I I wouldn't put him that high. You, You brought up Jimmy Carter. Yeah. Okay, Jimmy Carter, 98, 99 years old. He's turning uh, this October, right around your birthday, by the way. Yeah. Warren Buffett, 92. Charlie Munger, 99. George Soros, 92. Henry Kissinger, 100 years old. A couple famous actors, Harrison Ford, 81. Same age as Biden. What? You've just in Indiana Jones. Al Pacino, 83. De Niro, 79. Pesci, 80. Clint Eastwood, 93. Uh, the list goes on and on. But here's the point. We're talking about Biden and his life expectancy. At some point, once you reach 80-something years old and you're in okay health and you have money and you have the capabilities to survive, Biden's not going anywhere. And just like you made the reference, like you could run Jimmy Carter at 99 years old. Correct. That's basically what's going to happen with Biden. Yeah, and if, he, if for whatever reason he dies or doesn't run, Kamala Harris, I think, is actually more beatable than Biden. But Gavin Newsom is a far harder candidate than Joe Biden. Totally agree. Fantastic podcast today, Charlie. Thanks for coming out again, gang. Can I just plug one thing? Of course. If you guys want to subscribe to our podcast, we'd appreciate it. Thank you, Patrick. But but two things. Not only the podcast, put the link to his podcast below. And Turning Point USA. No, 100%. I was going to say that. So if you're local or you're not far from, get on a flight, go to a Turning Point USA event. Uh, they got an incredible lineup of speakers speaking at this event. People that, you know, Tucker just interviewed Tate, he's going to be there. Oh, yeah. President's going to be there. Uh, a lot of uh, people are going to be there. It's going to be a great opportunity to meet these folks there and put the podcast there. Aside from that, Charlie, thanks for coming. Thanks Maybe so much, next guys. time, you know what we haven't done yet? Maybe next time we do a live with a couple hundred people in that. attendance, we'll do it and do so people can ask you questions as well. Oh, Let's yeah. do that. My Thank man. You. Keep at it, brother. Thank, Thank you. you. Thank you. Take care, everybody. Bye-bye.